This is Deandra Beatty, and you're listening to The Bowler Show. Hi, this is Jackie Bowling, and you're listening to The Bowler Show. This is Jeff Riggles of Storm Products and TheEleventhFrame.com. You're listening to The Bowler Show. Hi, this is EJ Tackett, and you're listening to The Bowler Show. Welcome to The Bowler Show, featuring interviews with the biggest names in bowling today. Tonight, we're joined by former Team USA member, PBA 50 and PBA 60 standout Ron Moore, High Five Gear brand manager, multiple USBC Women's Open Championships titleist, and PWBA member Lindsay Boomershine, PBA member and current 2022 USBC Open Championships All Events leader Brett Cunningham, USBC Public Relations Director Aaron Smith, and possibly a special guest near the end of the show. But now your hosts, David the Waz Wazwo and myself, Luke Rosdahl. All right, welcome one, welcome all to another exciting edition of the Bowler Show. My name is Dave Wazwo, my co-host, Luke Rosdahl, right next to me. And Luke, you got a little bit of bowling going on today. We're going to start the show yeah. talking about the PBA playoffs and, of course, the PWBA Rockford Open that many people are probably watching right now instead of us. Let's Take a quick moment here where guests are, and we'll also go over uh, some of our sponsors. Let's start with our sponsors. Of course, we wouldn't be here without all of our sponsors. Uh, of course, our title sponsor, StormBowling.com. Go to that website for the best bowling products in the world. Uh, we're also brought to you by SNH Custom Homes, uh, Coolwick, I Am Bowling, SRGBBFS, Storm yeah. Roto Grip Bowling Balls for sale. Got that one right for one. It's an aggregate. One. Is it for him? Uh, Bowler's Mart, Double J's Pro Shop, and if I missed anything, sorry, we'll get back to you. But for now, that's uh, that's all I can think of right off the top. As we want to thank them first and foremost. Uh, we've got a good show today. We're going to start off with uh, PBA Hall of Famer Ron Moore. We're going to catch up with him and uh, his travails here recently. He had a good uh, USBC term. His team is sitting uh, in a great spot after they got done. And we'll uh, delve into his, his career before that also. Uh, around 6.40 p.m. Central, we're going to check in with Lindsay Boomershine. She got a chance to bowl this week. Uh, just missed the top 12 cut, so we'll check in with Lindsay. She's on her way to Chicago. Hopefully uh, we, we can connect with her good. And then, as you said, Brett Cunningham will be joining us, the All Events Leader, currently mm -hmm. at 22.20. And uh, we'll delve into how he tackled the lanes, how they did overall. Uh, he's top 17 in every event. That's hard to do. Yeah, no yeah. He what was. time uh, at the event that you that you uh, bowl. And then we're then the show could go anywhere from there. It could go a little awry. Uh, we have Aaron Smith's schedule, of course, as a lot of you know by now. Uh, Matt Canacero is no longer uh, with the USBC. And he, of course, in, it will no longer be with us because he's not there to report. Who, and who is there to report is his replacement, the one and only Aaron Smith, who has filled in for Matt many times before. So Aaron's a professional, but Aaron has some, uh, let's just put it this way, he's got some duties and he may not be at full strength. I didn't yeah. talk to you about that <laughs> off air, but uh, Aaron is uh, going to find a way to squeeze in uh, some talk about the Open Championships. Of course, we'll take a moment and talk about Matt also. But Aaron could be on at 720-ish, could be on at 740-ish. Uh, depending on what's going on, he's got so much going on. He's got the bargain team coming in at eight. He's got some 50, uh, 50 year guys coming in that he's preparing for also. So, uh, we're going to squeeze him in one way or the other. And also at that same time, we're going to try to squeeze in the PWBA winner of the Rockford Open. And, uh, I'm not sure we're going to be able to do that, but we'll see what we can do. Uh, Luke, why don't you take a moment and tell us how that tournament's going so far today. Uh, we got a chance to watch a little bit of it on CBS Sports Network. Yeah, yeah, we're keeping tabs on it so far. So, uh, spoilers, if you're not watching, you should have been watching, and I'm just <laughs> going to tell you what's going on anyway. And especially if we end up having the winner on later, you just, spoiler alert. More spoiling. So, uh, Stephanie Johnson outlasted Shannon O'Keefe in the first game. Uh, Best of friends. Yeah, and Shannon Great had kind much. of a rough start. She just didn't get comfortable. She was using two different balls on each lane, and uh, she just didn't get comfortable early enough. And then... Uh, Kelly Kulik looked like she was kind of faked out in practice because she got into the game and the first couple shots were okay. And then she kept missing the head pin. And so uh, Stephanie beat her pretty easily. And so now they're just getting ready for the start of the, uh, the match where Stephanie's going to bowl Brianna Clemmer, who used to be, I believe 
Stephanie, uh, no, Stephanie, Shannon O'Keefe used to coach her at McKendry, I believe. And wow. then uh, Liz Colkin awaits the winner of this upcoming match. So we're keeping tabs on it, but uh, we'll see what happens. Still, still a couple more games to go here. So, well, just as a, a quick analysis from you, from what we've seen on the lanes today, now you've got somebody coming in with the rev rate. Uh, how do you think this changes anything, or do you think Brand has a, a little bit of an advantage right now? I, I I don't know because the lanes look like they're really really high friction. I didn't get a chance to see what the pattern was, but definitely if they get it inside a little bit, it's going. And they the women bowl on pretty tough patterns. I don't know why, and people have wondered why this before. Why did the women bowl on tougher patterns? Was well, the PWBA have tougher patterns than the PBA? But uh, it's it doesn't look like the most it doesn't look like a super, super tough pattern this week, but it, it kept them honest. Right. It's one of those things, a lot of people are saying that about the, the Open Championships this year. Is it's not easy, per se, but it's really scorable. It doesn't really go out of its way to punish you. So if you're making good shots and you're in the right place, you're doing the right things, then you're going to score. If you aren't, then you're not. So that's kind of what it looked like looked like this week so far. And uh, Brianna's pretty – she throws a pretty – Pretty firm, I guess. I wouldn't say she throws it hard, but she gets a good roll on it, and she's she throws it pretty firm. So she throws it harder than I do. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's just put it that way. All right. Well, we'll keep an eye on that. We're, we're, we've got one eye on the the camera here, and one eye on the the tablet. And uh, you had one eye on the PBA playoffs earlier today. Now this mm-hmm. is already ended, so I don't think you'll be spoiling the party quite as much here. But uh, I didn't get a chance to watch it, but uh, I believe you did, and uh, yeah. I'm going to give a little recap of that. Yeah, uh, Kyle Troop won. He beat Tommy 3-1. It was best of three. And Kyle, it's kind of the way when Kyle, or no, it was when Chris Prather bowled Dom Barrett. Tommy bowled great all day long. Uh, Kyle just bowled better. It wasn't one of those things where uh, the, fir- the first game, Kyle had it, had it won pretty handily, and then Kyle had the front eight or front nine twice. And so it just came down to it is that Kyle just out out bowled him or outscored him or whatever. Definitely Tommy, Tommy didn't bowl bad by any stretch of the imagination. And if, if Kyle just would have given him a, an opportunity here or there, it might have been a different story. But uh, PBA playoffs in general was pretty high scoring, and then Kyle just outscored him. It's really what it was. It's kind of interesting to go back and watch because there was a whole lot of – because they bowled four games – it uh, started off with urethane, and then Kyle ended up going to reactive and making a huge jump left. And uh, Tommy ended up going to reactive on one lane and stuck with urethane on the other lane. So it's really interesting watching the transition and the, the thought processes and uh, just the what goes on at that high of a level. Well, we are going to stay at a high level. And we're going to take a moment here and bring in our first guest. Uh, as we talked about earlier, he is a PBA Hall of Famer. And uh, he has just wrecked the PBA Senior Tour since he joined. He's got, uh, I believe, a total of 11 PBA 50 titles, three PBA 60 titles, and four times in a row he has won the PBA 60 Player of the Year. So let's bring him in now. His name is Ron Moore. Ron, welcome to the Bowler Show. Well, good afternoon, guys, and I appreciate the opportunity. It, just looking at the lineup at the show today, it kind of reminds me of one of those tests where you try to pick the one that doesn't belong in the show. And a lot like my uh, my team or my uh, team event at Open Championships, I just was along for the ride. So anyway, I appreciate the time today. Hey, if you didn't strike out in the tenth, there you, you would have heard that. Kind of that one was one of the tougher, yeah, one of the tougher doubles that I've thrown in a while, just to get plus. So I didn't want to be the guy that that no, was no. Pac Man in any of their over. So that it was uh, it was fun and and. I mean, it just proved me if I would have stayed with that ball instead of trying to find what those guys had, um, I'd have been much better off. But sometimes you're looking for 230, end up with 170, and that's exactly what I did. All right. Well, let's let's go ahead and start with that then. We'll, we'll delve into your past here in a little bit. But uh, let's start with the USBC Open Championships. Obviously, your team had a, had a great day. Uh, your scores may not have been as of light, but take it. Take us through the day. Take us through, you know, Without giving away too many trade secrets, take mm-hmm. take us through the day how how you thought the lanes played this year, maybe as opposed to other years, and just how you felt overall. Um, well, I bowled quite a bit in the plaza. 
um, where where nationals are, and I know the higher the high side, the 31 to 60 side, hooks a little more, tends to be a little bit more high scoring. So we were happy that we drew that side, and the middle of the house even tends to play a little bit better. We were on 45 and 46. We had a great cross, of course. Anytime Matt McNeil is in your group, you know you're going to have a chance at an eagle. Mm -hmm. um, and we had bowled together a couple years, so we kind of had a good feel. We had one new player this year um, on our team that we hadn't bowled with and uh, that I got to know. Again, another guy that bowled great. Um, Lindsey Boomershine, who's on your show later, was part of our 10. Um, so we just had good 10 players that all played the game. It probably, um, if I would recommend anything as anybody that hasn't bowled yet, don't be surprised how quickly the lanes change. And we were probably um, the second or third frame of game one. We were already seeing some transition and ready to move in. And it just took me longer than the rest of the guys to open up the lane. But um, it was just uh, nice getting caught up in that jet stream and watching the guys perform. And honestly, I think probably by the second or third uh, frame of the last game, the third game, we were very comfortable. We were already 300 over. We knew we were going to take the lead. It was just by by how many, and that mindset just fulfilled itself. And I just tried to try to not take anything away. All right. Well, as you know, the storm is the storm. The show is sponsored by Storm. Luke and I, of course, are Storm staffers. So take us through some of the equipment they used uh, for team, and then also for singles and doubles. Um, the reality worked really well, 900 Global Reality. It's a, it, a really smooth ball for me. I call it one of my good news, bad news balls. The good news is the ball goes where you throw it. The bad news is the ball goes where you throw it. So um, it, it gives me a very true read. It doesn't overreact. So I started out, and in fact, I ended up in the team event throwing the reality. I tried to go to an IQ Tour and a hyped Pearl in the middle to try to give me a little bit more back-end reaction. To what I could see those guys, because I mean, we had a couple shots where I sure they had missed right and the ball just came back. So it was no problem. So I was looking for that, got lost a little bit. Um, in doubles and singles, we ended up on the other side of the house where it's not quite as high scoring. And I just kind of ground out about even for, I think I had 12, 40 something for the six games. Um, trying a little bit of everything. I tried staying right with the UC2. I even tried the UC3. Um, without a lot of success, but I don't think I could blame the balls. I mean, it's, uh, it was, it was me, um, just not getting comfortable and finding, you know, feeling like I could just relax and just make good shots. All right. Well, let's go ahead and go back to the, the start of your career or the start of when we knew, uh, of Ron Moore, uh, around the 2008, 2009 season, uh, when you decided to start bowling the, the senior tournaments, uh, we, we all know you grew up in Alaska and you, you bowled there and honed your game there. Um, how much tournament bowling did you do before that? And, and did you do anything on the PBA tour as far as uh, bowling some events? Uh, no, they're all, all great questions. Um, I had, I had made team USA. I, the first time I tried it in 1988. So I qualified for the 1989 team and we got some invites like to the U S open. And so I did get to bowl some of those events um, but not on the regular tour. I mean, for a, a couple reasons, I'd like to believe, you know, if I'd have gone out, I'd maybe had some success, but the truth is I was chicken. I mean, the superstars were Houston and Walter Ray and Earl and Mark Roth and Marshall and those guys. And I mean, there's no way that I even could even picture myself, you know, in that category. So I didn't bowl much on tour. My most exposure was, was team USA. And that was probably what added to I mean, my mindset that there's a lot more out there and you never know the potential exists that maybe you could have some success at this game. And you kind of mentioned some of the guys that I wasn't scared to bowl. Unfortunately, I wish I would have been scared to bowl. I have a donator back in the late 80s, early 90s portion, and, uh, and now I'm doing a, a radio slash internet show instead of out there. Because people are like, hey, why don't you go back out there and try? I'm like, those are the same guys that beat me in the 80s, and they're <laughs> – still in great shape and still doing what they do. Um, one of the things I found out about you online, speaking of great shape, um, it, it says that you've done 2 million sit-ups and 1 million push-ups here in the last 20 years. Is that, uh, is that an accurate statement? That is true. I've kept a log since 1999 um, for a couple of reasons. One, just to see what the number gets to. 
Um, and now if I don't make a log entry in a day, I feel guilty, right? So I keep the log mm -hmm. and I'm, I think I'm at 2.45 million. I average about a hundred thousand setups a year. So I'm at 2.45 million setups and about 1.2 million pushups. So uh, it's just something that I can do in the hotel room. You know, I don't have to find a gym. I don't have to take my clothes so I can take a shower. It's something I can do right there in the hotel room. Um, and I, you know, I appreciate the patience of the guys that I've roomed with because they've seen it, um, you know, the whole process, but no, that's a, that's a true story. I'm at, uh, I'm, I'll get to 2.5 million by the end of this year and about 1.3 push-ups for the end of this year. I think I'm at about 2.45 overall in my career. <laughs> Uh, set up and push ups. I, I I remember in school that uh, they make fun of me, but that's a that's a different story. Luke, Luke, how many push ups and sit ups have you done in your life? Do you know? I have no idea. I think I did like twelve earlier today. But I don't <laughs> no, I mean I found that I mean if I do a workout, you know, a couple hours before it's time to go bowl, that I've got the endorphins flow and I feel I mean it just helps me relax. It's just kind of a routine that I've been able to establish. So if I have a squad that starts. 11 a.m. or later, then I'll work out in the morning. Otherwise, I'll wait till the squat's done and then I'll do some cardio or do a, a workout afterwards. All right. You also talk a little bit about uh, your mental focus when, you know, you were, you were an air, air traffic controller. That's got to be one of the more stressful jobs you could possibly have. Uh, take us through the, the more between air controller, controller to, to, hey, I think I'm going to go try the senior PBA tour. Um, I, I probably, if there was anything, I mean, the, the, what you develop in, in ATC or in air traffic control is the ability to discard the riffraff and make decisions quickly on the stuff that matters. Um, and also, I mean, when you get out the bowl, it's not life or death. I've done that for 25 years already. So, um, we would describe the job primarily as eight hours of boredom interrupted by 15 minutes of intense panic which can be kind of like a step ladder um, when you get into those situations. But uh, I think probably if it helped anything, it helped me keep everything in perspective and quick decision-making and commit to your decisions. Um, it's just, uh, you know, as I mentioned, you know, there's lots of minutia that comes on and that you're introduced to that really doesn't matter in your decision. And you commit to what you believe is true and move on. And at what point did you realize, hey, I, I think I've made the right decision? You started off uh, pretty pretty quickly in your career. Yeah, I mean, it was it was very interesting that I I thought, oh, well, the FAA contracts their training. So I went to the contractor and said, I'd like to retire, but I want to take five months off so I can bowl April through September. And they said, welcome aboard. So I had that part worked out. I got my pension. I had a job as a backup so I could go out just to bowl. I wasn't bowling for my lunch money. And so I, we started out, there were three stops in Dayton, Ohio, Rockford, Illinois, and Jackson, Michigan were the first three stops. And I said, well, you know, here's the rules. I know if I cash twice or win once, I have to join. So I'm going to go bowl these three as a non-member and we'll see how it goes. If it doesn't go well, well, I gave it a shot. Um, if it goes well, I'll join and we'll see what happens. So I think the first stop I qualified fifth and the second stop I qualified third. Um, the, so I joined and then promptly didn't cash in the third stop. So, but anyway, I thought it was, it was like an epiphany. It was like, you know, you never know, maybe I could be competitive. I still didn't picture myself as belonging out there. I mean, I crossed with Tita Semez the very first stop. Harry Sullins was there next to me. Wayne Webb was, you know, coming out there. Fortunately, Walter Ray and Pete and those guys weren't 50 yet. So I had a couple of years ahead of them mm -hmm. so I could go out and compete before high school let out and the big kids showed up. So <laughs> I, I went out um, in 2008, pulled the whole stop, um, probably had more fun than I ever had bowling. Um, and part of it was the realization that you could compete here. So now the next thing is I have to learn. I have to learn how to win. And um, in 2009, the second year, I made a few grip changes. I still remember pretty specifically. I shot 822 in league the night before I left to go on tour in 2009. 
going with a lot of confidence. I feel like I'm throwing the ball pretty good and promptly win the first two stops in 2009 and ended up being player of the year. So it went from epiphany that you could be, that you can compete to having your banner hung on the masking unit. And it's so much more than I ever expected, or uh, I, I've just been so blessed to go out there. And, and again, my 2009 year was the most rewarding season I've had in bowling, but 2008 was the most fun in finding out that you might be competitive out here. You never know. All right. Take a moment and talk about, you know, you talked about some of the, the players that were out there. Of course, some of the big names that you avoided early on that ended up bowling with you on the senior <laughs> tour later. Uh, just think of one match, maybe one, one, what's your, what's your favorite match you've ever bowled or just the most important match you've ever bowled? No, I remember it was uh, in 2011. Um, my wife had passed in January. Um, so I still went back out on tour just because I know she would have wanted me to do that. And I was having a pretty good year. Um, I qualified fourth for the stepladder for the senior U S open at Suncoast. And, and then there's so much more to this story about how many good things happened to me. I mean, if we got a few minutes, part of the interesting story was we're going into the last block to try to get to the, to the stepladder. Um, I'm in the hunt, obviously. Bo Gergen is right behind me. He thinks that the squad starts at two. It starts at noon. He shows up at the end of practice and bowls the first two frames in his street shoes, goes open, open. In any case, he ends up fifth. I end up fourth by about 20 pins. So it was, again, something that happened so that I made the show. Uh, my first match is against Wayne Webb. I make the 410 to win the match 265 to 258 wow. and then go on to uh, beat Harry Sullins and Walter Ray to win the U.S. Open in 2011. And that was, I mean, not only the fact that my wife had passed and I had, you know, her helping me out the whole time, but just to go through that stepladder and, uh, and to snag a major, um, that, was, that was as good as it, it was ever going to get, I think, right there. That's awesome. Good, good, good stuff. Um, I'm a little embarrassed to say I haven't made it out to the senior shootout, even though I was going to <laughs> multiple times. It just hasn't happened. It's a little tricky for me to get get out there that time of the year. But um, are you going to? Is there a 2022 shootout on the horizon? Absolutely. And in fact, we started a super senior shootout last year. So the first senior shootout um, was in 2016. This year, I just took my 180th entry. I capped that one at 180. Uh, last weekend. So that one is full. The super senior shootout runs immediately after. So the first one is Monday through Friday this year. It's November 7 to 11. The super senior shootout goes, it's for players 16 over with similar rules, less than three PBA national titles. And it's Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Um, and I, that one is full as well. So I have 300 entries plus standby already for the tournament that's in November. And I tell you, I'd, I'd love to have you guys out. The more good players that I get in the event, the better it is for the event. And I'm just from watching the first four or five weeks on the senior tour, my patterns aren't that soft. So um, <laughs> it's a little more challenging, but the cut numbers, as far as I'm concerned, the cut numbers are perfect. It's 205 to 210 average to make the finals. Uh, the patterns are demanding, but if you play them, of course, you know, somebody averages 230. And so that they play very fair, uh, and my wife and I are very proud of both the senior shootout and the super senior shootout that um, we get tremendous support from South Point. And um, we I mean, that's that's our focus right now is just making sure that it runs as well as it possibly can. All right. Well, I, I promise I'll try to find a way out there. I got to double check, make sure I don't have three national titles. Um, yeah, pretty, there you sure go. <laughs> pretty sure well, I don't have to worry about that. But seriously, I, I would like to make it out there to. Uh, you have the David Haynes shootout and a couple other ones that I can't think of, but you've got right. different well, events too. It's not just a one event thing. No, it's a week long. It's a world series for seniors, essentially for seniors with less than three PBA national titles. We have um, an optional sweeper on day one where you bowl one game on each of the three patterns that we use throughout the week. So you start on whatever a 35, a 39 or a 43 foot pattern, and then good luck when you move. Mm -hmm. Um, on Tuesday, we have a one-day event where we crown a champion that evening. We have a six-game qualifier and then a finals. We do the same thing Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, a six-game qualifier on a different pattern with a different final. So I crown a champion each day, 
and then I take the top 32 based on where your what your qualifying position was on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I just add those up, and I take the top 32 into Friday. Again, with 180 players, we pay 62 spots. I pay 52 regular players plus 10 players over age 60. So we do our best to spread the money around. But again, some every year somebody makes seven to ten thousand dollars. So uh, we're pretty proud of it. And as I said, last year we did the Super Senior Shootout for the first time, and in the nine days, Monday through the following Tuesday, we paid out, including brackets and side pots, a little bit over two hundred and fifty-five thousand dollars. So. We're proud of that. Like I said, we're proud of the event and we'd love to have you out there. It'd be great. So not only you could, you could see from firsthand experience uh, on the show, you could talk about it a little bit. That would help. All righty. So uh, I, this, this question's probably already been answered, but with the amount of success that you've had and the, I mean, I've, I've got your bio up here and it's just, you just kind of exploded onto things. You got all kinds of PBA 50, 60 regional titles. Uh, you know, there, there's just a bunch of senior accomplishments. And then now, especially with having Walter Ray and, you know, Norm Duke and Pete Weber out there now and being able to compete with those guys, did you wish that you might have taken the leap into the, the regular PBA or do you think that everything kind of worked out pretty well? Um, you know, that's, of course you wonder, you know, of course you wonder how maybe, you know, had you given yourself the same opportunity to gone out, okay, the first year I'm going to learn, find out whether or not I'd be competitive. If I find out I'm competitive, then maybe I might have some success. I mean, probably one of the most flattering comments that I got was from Walter Ray was that he said he probably wouldn't have as many titles had I gone out there. No, that doesn't mean that I would have won it but the circumstance could have prevented him somehow from not winning the title. Um, but in all honesty, I mean, uh, I, I loved the job as an air traffic controller. I looked forward to going to work every day. It was exciting and it set me up with a pension. So I didn't have to bowl. Uh, and, you know, I didn't have to bowl for my lunch money when I could go out. So I think if I had to honestly answer your question, I think I had success on the senior tour because of my choices earlier of not going out on the tour. Yeah. And that, uh, that is, it's kind of an interesting way to look at it, but I mean, yeah, that, that's a lot of people say, don't bowl with your, don't, don't bowl with the rent money. And <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not one of those people either. If I've, I can't bowl with the, if I don't feel like I could just have it fall out of my pocket and not worry mm -hmm. about it or something, then it's, it's probably not a thing for me to do. Um, but yeah, looking at, Looking at, uh, there's some interesting things on here. It says that you had a personal best series of 888. So that's a number. When did uh, when did that happen? I think that it was 2016 or 2017. I was bowling. We bowl league at South Point, of course. I, I mean, I live 20 minutes from there, so we bowl league there. It's a singles league, so it's one you know one player per team. Scratch. You move lanes after every game, um, and I still remember I shot 298. Left a 6'10 on the fill, went to a different pair, left a 2'8, uh, made the spare, and then threw the last 23, changing lanes after each game. So, and I knew at the time 878 or 879 was the highest in the house, and it might have been highest in the Las Vegas uh, Southern Nevada Bowling Association. So, when I got seven or eight of the last game, I thought I still have a chance at this and was able to finish with 300 for for the 888. So 34 out of 36 missed twice, just happened to miss in the right place. So I could get to the 888 <laughs> series. So, uh, throwing a phase two, that was, I mean, you know, you just get in the zone and you just feel like I just have to be good today. And if I'm good, I'm going to strike a lot. And that's kind of what it was. And that's the big trick there too, is moving from pair to pair to pair. That's, um, that's that makes it so much more impressive even if even if you bowl at a uh, at a center a lot and you know okay well I, I know what this pair does i know what this pair right. i know, know what this pair but still you don't you don't know you got to pay attention to who you're following and and where they were playing and what they were doing and just that just makes it so much more impressive yeah i mean and so, again I, i'm sure you know if i were to look back and see who i followed i mean i'm sure they all contributed to it i mean i obviously made a, a reasonable number of good shots, but yeah, I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if I went back and looked um, that the pairs that I drew 
were generally high scoring. I know I bowled one of the games. I started on one and two, which was fortunate because if you go to one and two, I know one and two hooks, uh, especially lane one hooks an arrow more than anything else in the building. So at least I was able to start there and then make a move so I could move back a little right when I went to other pairs. So no, it worked out great, but no, that was a, that was a number that, I mean, when you get to numbers that it matters where you miss in the game, um, yeah. those are pretty impressive numbers. So I, I'm pretty proud of that. Yeah, definitely. So there's still a couple months left of nationals. Uh, he, I know that Dave's going about a month. My group is bowling the last, the next to last couple of days. We're bowling in the middle of July. So uh, what a little? I know we talked about it a little bit earlier, but what's a little bit of intel here? We got we got a couple couple months left, and there's still a bunch of people left to go. So is there any? Uh, specific things that your specific tips or tricks, hints uh, that you would uh, give anybody? Yeah. I mean, it's uh, kind of what I touched on earlier is believe what you're seeing. Don't be surprised how quickly the lanes transition. Um, and I mean, if I'd be honest about it, we, as a team, the 10 players, we didn't try to start out, you know, to grind out a spot between seven and 10 and then gradually move left. I think all our guys, we stuck with our A game. We talked a lot about what we saw and weren't surprised when every two or three frames you were making a two and one left. Um, but the pair that we got, again, um, opened up pretty nicely. We had 10 good players on the pair. So I, my my bit of advice was believe what you're seeing. Every ball you throw good tells you something and believe what you're seeing because literally it was probably second or third frame of game one when we slowly began the transition left and they just opened up nice. I mean, we had guys that threw the ball uh, great, obviously. Um, but that would be my, my suggestion. And, and I wouldn't look for a, you know, a big back end hook and ball, something that's pretty smooth and goes where you throw it and you'll be fine. I mean, there's any number of 32, 3,300 scores out there. That's a pretty respectable. I think our score was the fifth highest of all time. And two of those were in Reno when there was a 37 and a 35. So um, I, we're excited to have people shoot at that number. We're fortunate to post it as early in the tournament as we did because, you know, shooting at a number is sometimes challenging. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that that's uh, along the lines of, of what I've heard is that they start off a little bit more playable. And that's the word that's been used is playable, not necessarily scorable, because I had a I had a buddy of mine that went out that's, that's pretty good. I think he shot 20, almost shot 2,100 for all events. And he said, yeah, they're they're a little bit more playable. He's like, I missed a move and had a bad game. And he said, it, it's really easy for that to happen to you or for just things to not quite go your way. But they start off a little bit more playable. And then, uh, oh, gosh, I forgot the other thing I was going to say. But <laughs> No, but that's exactly true. I mean, we our first game we shot 12.03. And if you, if you look at the – Oh, yeah. At most of the scores, the player, the, the higher team scores, there you'll see a lot of 10-20s, 11 11 something like that, where they build on those. And somehow we get out of the box again. Matt McNeil opens the first frame and shoots 279. So when he's your leadoff guy and he shoots 279 and you shoot 1,200 out of the box, you yeah, think this is going to be a pretty fun day. You know, and it's just um, I, I would have to give a lot of credit to, to, to Matt it's no secret that he does as well as he does in this event. I mean, he makes a science of it. He pays a close attention to it. He puts together the teams that's going to, that are going to gel. And so the fact that he has, I don't know how many, three, four, five Eagles shouldn't surprise anyone. And just to be in his group of 10 um, uh, is an honor in itself. Yeah. And I think the, the funny thing there too, is everybody, Oh, he's on the left side and nothing ever changes over there and whatever. And, Back when they did have the live streams, I remember watching a couple of them. And, I mean, it also helps that he never misses, too. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, too. But uh, they have been using fire oil out there the last several years, too, if I believe. And that's uh, that usually means that it's going to be the transition's going to be, be a little bit quicker. It's a little bit more scorable to begin with, but it doesn't, it doesn't hold up near as well as something like ice does. So that might be another little tidbit that... My hamsters are spent a little bit too fast about, but right, no <laughs> extra information. So. No, and we and we work a little bit with that in in the senior shootout. I mean, I, I work with Joe Stewart, who's the head mechanic there, about whether 
we use fire, whether we use ice, whether we use a mixture front and back or whatever we're trying to do to, to keep the patterns scorable, um, mm -hmm. playable, I should say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I got to correct Luke. Uh, Matt McNeil did miss out there. He missed the first frame of team. He didn't miss anything after that. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no, seriously. Uh, Ron, we got a question in on our chat line. They're, they're curious uh, if you had to make a guess on the length of the two patterns. Oh, well, let, let me let me share uh, let me share one story about that. It was kind of interesting. We had a team from England that came and they did the you know the team practice session downstairs. Yeah. And when they were done, they walked down next to lane thirty two just to kind of get a look at the pattern from the other side. Mm -hmm. And the two players that walked down there were disqualified by USBC from team event. Oh, oh yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, um, this or that but you know if i if i had to guess um 42 to 43 for the team event and a little shorter for singles and doubles again i honestly i don't know what they are but it, it seemed for me when i squared up on and doubles and singles i couldn't get the ball to push as as well as i could in the team event to get the ball down the lane so you know, it, it seemed like it wanted to hook early if I squared up and wiggle a little bit if I gave it some room. So um, that was just what I saw. Yeah, and that, that's kind of interesting because I think it was about the I think it was the same way last year. And traditionally it had been where the, the team pattern was was pretty short, well, not necessarily short, you know, 38, 39, 40. But then the, the doubles and singles was always, you know, 41, 42, 43. And last year they flipped it. And so it's kind of interesting to see that again this year because i've kind of heard the same thing as the team patterns a little bit uh not necessarily wetter not it just yeah it's that's probably what it is it's probably just a couple feet longer so yeah and i mean i did go over there yesterday watch um jeff riggles group bold um doubles and singles yesterday i know riggles shot 750 in singles so uh, and they stayed right as long as they could i was surprised from watching them I mean, by staying right, I mean, I don't think anybody got left of maybe 15, 16, 17 at the arrows mm -hmm. um, and just kept the ball in play. Um, I know in the doubles and things, I think low man in their in their singles event was like 680 or 690 of the four players that were bowling on that pair. So uh, and everybody that I've talked to, the longer you can stay right in the doubles and singles pattern, the better off you're going to be. Again, the high side in that house tends to hook a little more. It's a little bit more high scoring. You have a little bit more room if you miss right, it'll roll up. So um, the low side can be a challenge on occasion. Yeah, and bouncing off uh, your your guys from England story, I I ended up working uh, for a month last year at the championship, so I was unable to bowl when I was working in uh, media with Matt Canazaro, and Matt said, "Hey, I've got a job for you. Run down the side down lane thirty two and put this special pin that was signed by Bob Hart, put it in front of a rack and uh, take a picture. So I started <laughs> strolling down there with my camera and, and the bowling pin, and I got about 30 feet down, and I just about got tackled. And the guy said, hey, what, what are you doing? Right. I, said, I was just told to, to run down here. He's like, you cannot walk down the side of this because of that fact. You can kind of see where the oil uh, had stopped, and he ended up taking the picture for me. So that, uh, <laughs> that really hit home. That's a... Uh, that's something they're really on top of because, it, it, you know, even some little information like that, just, you know, from your eyes uh, can be a big thing. So uh, well, I'm mean, going to get yeah. left here. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, I mean, the first time you allow somebody to do that, you're going to get a hundred people wandering wow. down there every day, taking a look from the other side. Wow. And, yeah. So wow. I get wow. it. Wow. It's just an unfortunate set of circumstances. So. Yeah, that's too bad that the, that happened for him, but that's uh, obviously they don't want people down there. Um, this is the part of the show Luke likes the most. I want to ask you uh, a couple of quick questions here on the way out. Uh, your favorite person to cross with on the senior PBA tour and your least favorite? <laughs> uh, my least favorite would be any left-hander that has the whole left side of the lane when I've got two boards to shoot at. <laughs> I mean, and I, hey, Ron, I say really that again. We have the computer. Oh, yeah, no problem. No, <laughs> say, I, say that again. 
Uh, my least favorite would be any left-hander that has the whole left side of the lane and I've got two boards to shoot at, or they're playing three, four, five, and I'm playing 17. And, uh, um, yeah. and, and, and again, I get it. It's just unfortunate that it's so hard on occasion to make it a level playing field. Um, and if I had to pick somebody to cross with, probably honestly, it would be Pete Weber. I mean, just, just because of his passion and his effort and, Actually, I mean, he's a fiery guy, but he is a good guy to bowl with. He really is. And you know he's going to be out there giving you 100%. And you figure if you can keep up with Pete, you're going to, you're in for a good payday. So you're probably okay. We're, we're both ambidextrous. We both have honor scores with each hand. And so we, we kind of wow. get – we get both sides of the argument. So it's very, <laughs> very interesting. Yeah, I mean – yeah, and it looks, I mean, just looking at the scores, again, for the last couple of weeks, the patterns, the ratios that they're using, they tend to get cliffed. And obviously that happens much more on the right than they than it does on the left. And so I think mm -hmm. I think we had, uh, well, we had last week, we had Parker. Not that these guys aren't great players. That's not, that's not where I'm going with that. But Parker and uh, Jason Couch go one, two. This year, I think Mike Haggett shot two 300s today as leading. Um, and so it can get a little frustrating with some of the ratios that they use on the senior tour and um, how challenged they can be. If you miss a board right, it's through the face and the board left and it doesn't get there. So, but nonetheless, it's the best game in town. I love bowling out there with those guys. And um, hopefully um, a couple tournaments coming up here in Vegas will go well and I'll get out there for the last half of the season and have some success the rest of this year. All right, Ron, on the way out, take a moment and just talk about uh, your sponsor, a friend or a coach who's kind of helped you out along the way. Or... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm blessed to be a member of Squad RG. Um, Chris Schlemmer has been a great help. And I was actually Ebonite, EBI Brands, when I first um, was picked up with a sponsor. And Chris Schlemmer even helped me out when I was with EBI. And so... Um, when I got the chance to go with uh, Storm Brands, um, I really jumped at that. So I've been so fortunate to, to get the support. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm on the Roto-Grip National Tour staff, but of course we can throw Storm and 900 Global Equipment. Um, Turbo provides me with anything that I need. All I need to do is ask, um, get everything out there. And um, again, just thank you for all the people that I've traveled with that have put up with my idiosyncrasies and the things that I need to do um, to feel like I, I bowl well and I've given 100% when I'm out there. So, again, uh, well, some of the honors that I've got are individual honors. They're not earned individually. And so thanks to everybody that I grew up watching and um, the sponsor that have supported me uh, to get me to where I've, where I've been able to get to. All right, Ron, good stuff. We got to spend a little bit of extra time with you here today, and we appreciate you doing that. Uh, for us, uh, I don't always say this uh, about every guest that we have on the show, but uh, I've met you in person, and you truly are one of the good guys in our sport, and uh, we appreciate you spending some time with us here today on the Bowler Show. Well, I was I was flattered that you asked and humbled for the opportunity, so thank you so much. I really appreciate it, guys. Thanks a lot. All right, Ron, you have a good night. All right, take care. All right, Luke, let's uh, take a quick moment here. We've got a couple of guests already in the in the queue there yeah um get us up to date pwba match here before we move on to our pwba table all right so if you're just joining us uh, stephanie johnson beat o'keefe in the first match stephanie also then beat uh, kelly kulik in the second match she has also defeated brianna clemmer and they're just in the early stages early couple frames here of the championship match it looks like they're pretty close to even uh her and Tolkien. So we'll, we'll kind of keep tabs on that as we, as we talk to Lindsay here, but that's what's going on with the PWBA finals of the Rockford Open. Okay. And Lindsay ended up bowling the Rockford Open, just missed out on the top 12. She would have had her chance to make the show. So it uh, looks like she's good to go. She's in the queue and ready to go. Uh, she is a Storm Roto member, of course, uh, staff member. Uh, she joined the PBA, of course, 2015 when it came back. Lindsay, welcome to the Bowler Show. Hi, no problem with technology. You good to go? I think so. I have my chair up. 
so I think we're I think we're good. Can you guys see me? Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're yeah. getting there now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We've got you on the, the skinny phone view here, but that's okay. We yeah, have no issues oh, with that. Uh, want me to turn it the other way? Oh, you're good. You're good. Okay. Yeah, if, if I can get the computer to move a little bit faster here, this would, this would uh, help on our end. So you'll be fine as soon as the uh, computer decides to cooperate. So okay. we're good. There, there there's perfect. Go. Perfect view. There we go. All right. Lindsay, okay. uh, you, as we said, and we've been talking about today, watching the show, you bowled this week at the Rockford Open. Uh, let's start yeah. off with that. Take us three. Oh, when you moved her, we might have lost her. Mm. I'm sorry. Stand by. Can you hear me? Uh, it's catching up. Oh, there it goes. It's Ryan. Okay. Hi. Okay, were you able to hear my question? No, I was not. I'm sorry. Okay, just take, take a moment and take us through the week here in, in Rockford. Uh, you know, it's it's an amazing thing to be able to go and do what you love. Um, and that's like my biggest thing. Uh, I, that's why I love bowling the PWBA. That's why it's so great that it's back every year since 2015, since the relaunch. And, um, you know, I feel like I've bowled extremely well. Uh, you know, to say I wasn't nervous when you haven't competed, you know, in a, in, in a whole season is... Uh, it's just, it is what it is, I guess. So I was in the building that my really good friend Tish Johnson had won at, at the Cherry Bowl when they were so amazing. Uh, and so I had a good week. Um, I wish that I would have made the top 12 and gave my chance for the show, but you know, it is what it is. And, uh, I'm taking this whole momentum into women's nationals and Queens next week. So. All right, we, you talked about just getting the chance to bowl on tour when you were at college as a four-time All-American in Nebraska. Uh, all of a sudden, that chance went away. Where Was that something you were thinking about when you were in college is, hey, I'm going to go out on the LPBT tour and, uh, and bowl? Or was that something that wasn't quite uh, in your thoughts yet? No, I, that, that's what I um, dreamt of. I mean, I, I grew up watching. My uncle Tom uh, Baker Bull, and uh, he was so amazing. And I got to go watch him bowl actually on tour, and that I was like, "This is what I want to do." So that's kind of where like it inspired me to do that. Um, other than that, um, I just loved a bowl, and I have a, I think I have a true talent for it. So um, you know, that's my motivation, and you know, that's my goal for forever. Okay. And at Nebraska, this is one of Luke's other favorite questions. Uh, uh, <laughs> how horrible was it to work with Bill Straub? <laughs> he, um, he was a very uh, good coach and it was a very amazing program. And uh, I was lucky to be one of his favorite people that he, you know, nominated to be on his team. Um, to me, it wasn't very difficult at all, um, but uh, if you put in the work and you have the talent and you show up, I mean, he kind of like left me alone, so maybe I was like safe. <laughs> um, but other than that, um, you know, he's, it's an amazing program and, you know, I, I always tell junior bowlers to aspire to go to college because it taught me so much. I really did. Now, some of the things that he coached you on, of course, we know all of the, the Nebraska players are famous for their push away. Uh, do you still use a lot of that in your game today? No. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, um, besides for the push away, I do use the fundamentals. Um, I've always had good footwork, spare shooting, um, and that was kind of what I took with me. Um, but the push away thing, it uh, it kind of uh, took me out of my element. So I've just been working with Hank on changing that a little bit. Uh, I don't I don't think it was for me, but that doesn't mean that it's not for someone else. Now you mentioned Hank, of course, your husband. How much how much influence does he have over your bowling? How much do you guys do? I know you're a bronze level coach. Um, how how well do you do accepting the the help from Hank? 
Um, <laughs> with my perfectionism, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I to be better than I was, you know, the day before or the last year or the, you know, it, it, he's amazing. Uh, so I am like what I see and he helps me out and he's also like my best friend. So, you know, it's really just kind of like this hand in hand thing where we go and do fun stuff together, but also, um, Alex Hoskins, that is, you know, basically underneath Hank for R and D. Um, he's an amazing person. He's like one of my best friends, but he spends most of the time with me, um, with my, um, perfectionist attitude and he works with me on ball motion and, you know, just really seeing the lane correctly and staying true to myself. So, um, I'm very lucky. Uh, and so that's who I work with on a daily basis. And then I also uh, do some of the ball testing for Hank and Alex. So that kind of is what jump started the whole thing of, um, you know, watching me bowl. And as I mentioned, your bronze level coach, take, take us through a little bit of uh, maybe some of the, the things that you as a coach uh, concentrate on, you know, mental game or certain aspects of the game. What, what is your favorite part uh, of coaching? So uh, I work with Mike Shady. Um, he's an amazing mental coach. Um, so I don't really do much more than ask him advice. Um, but he's amazing on the mental game and the process and what you need to go through. Uh, my favorite part about coaching is you know, junior bowlers because the, they're the future for our sport. And uh, you know, I love helping them out. I take all of my old stuff and I give it all to the, you know, junior program. And, you know, I'm like, hey, you can have this plugged, but, you know, you can pick what ball you want. So it's, um, you know, liberating, I would say, to help someone else out just like everyone had helped me. And so that's how I feel like we can grow and continue to um, have a future for bowling, uh, especially because they are like the future for us. And I just love it. I love their enthusiasm. And that's what I'm kind of taking out um, going on tour is just kind of enjoying myself. And I tell them that, like, you know, enjoy yourself. Have fun. Now, with the juniors in mind, you, you have a, a young man who's get, just getting into bowling. Talk a little bit about Aiden and his bowling. <laughs> um, I told him he can bowl whichever way he wants. Like, if he wants to do two-handed, left-handed, right-handed you know, both, whatever. Um, so like super excited about it. We did that Mother's Day video that we did. And it was so fun because we got to do something together and he got to really see like what I do and who I am. And he's at the age where he can comprehend that. So um, it was super sad leaving. I cried um, <laughs> when I went to drop me off but um you know you have to live your dreams and i i hope that that's what he's seeing um and i hope that he gets to do whatever he wants if it's golf bowling football whatever whatever he wants to do is is my main concern and um when they asked me what do you want for aiden i said just to be happy because i feel like if you're happy then you're a good person and then you're good in life all right. Uh, you're, you talked about your bowling and, and your coaching, and you're out there bowling on the PWBA tour. Uh, what are you doing for a full time job nowadays? So I am actually the brand manager, H five G, H five G brands. Uh, make people know as High Five Gear, uh, and that's what I do for my, um, you know, part time, full time job. Besides for bowling, um, I love it. And it provides me with like the best apparel because I feel like if you look good, you can bowl good. And uh, that's kind of what I do. I do all the social media for them as well. Um, it's just an amazing company um, to work for and the owner that started it, Todd. All right. So I could, uh, first of all, I can tell you from the, from the kids side of things, it does get, it does get quite a bit. Uh, even better than what it is now. They're fun when they're little, and then when they get older, and the, the teenage years are always fun. I'm sure you can remember your own teenage years. 
but once you can, you'll have a little bit of head button with that. But once they get to be an adult and they they think about it from their newfound perspective now, and that's when it really gets fun is when they when they get when they graduate high school and they, they start to live their own life. And then they you get the apologies and then you get the oh, yeah, I understand this now. And so it, it, it does. There's there's different levels of, of fun for having kids. But anyway, I'm, I'm a huge PWBA f- tour fan. Um, and so this this is always very exciting when I get to talk to um, to one of the ladies. The guys are OK, too, but I'd, I'd rather talk to the women. So um, <laughs> myself also being a perfectionist, my heart hurts for you on TV sometimes or when you get to the finals matches, because, yeah, there's some there's been some nerves. There's been some not so great shots, but you can't catch a break to save your life on TV. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like. And so talk about the several shows you've been on and uh, you know, how you kind of process that and get through it and be okay with it and try to build on it. And I know I just threw a bunch of stuff at you, but just, just talk about it. So I'm, um, most people don't know, but I'm a super emotional person. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't look that way, um, but I am. And, you know, going through all of it was extremely hard, um, but I didn't want to realize like who I was or who I was going to be. Um, and I feel like I finally did that. Sorry, a little choked up. Cause this is how much I actually care, um, yeah. you know, and um, I think just, you know, being you, like, I know that sounds repetitive, but I, you know, I wasn't me for so long um, and it was just a process to go through and I was so scared to make a mistake or disappoint people. And um, I guess what I found out was, that I never disappointed anyone at all. And mm-hmm. they truly like, seriously, like love me. Like, you know, my poor, so yeah, it's, um, I can't wait. Cause I know I'm gonna win a title and it's just a process I think everyone or any athlete has to go through. And, you know, it's, it's about being mentally and it's about physically being healthy and it's just about being real and um that's really like what i'm about is just being real i'm I'm a real person don't be scared to come talk to me like i won't bite you um (laughs) (laughs) most people think that but it's uh it's it's something that is going to make me a better person which when i do win it's going to make me a better champion so I hope I can exude that to future people that, you know, it's, it's not as easy as it seems and it's never going to be because something that's amazing as great as, as it is to be able to pull out on tour is, you know, something that I really enjoy. So yeah, I, I'm sorry, but you wanted a real answer. And so you asked a real question and you know, that's just me. So that's kind of my like process, but I feel like I bowled really well. I wish I would have bowled better, um, but um, you know I'm not holding any expectations at all. Uh, my best friend, my BFF, my PWBA roommate, um, Alicia, she's finally back. She's gonna bowl queens. So I mean, uh, you know, I'm just excited to like actually hug her and for her to be healthy again and for us to do this together. Yeah. Well, that the um, that was the next thing I was going to say is you do hold it together really well, but I can tell just how much you care. It's uh, I, that's one of the things that's one of the reasons I really like watching you. And as far as far as the perfectionism thing, no matter how good I throw a shot, I can always find something wrong with it. So it, it just seems like, uh, no, you just you just care so much. And it, again, that's that's why it that's why it. <laughs> it, it hurts me as a fan of, you know, watching you. And uh, so I, I don't know. <laughs> and then, I don't know. It's kind of funny because it's, it's the same thing as when you talk about feeling like you're disappointing people or whatever else you get. So 
you care so much that you get so wound up that you can't hardly think or talk sometimes. And so I, I mean, you've got to be like my spirit animal or something, I guess. So I, um, I, you know, it, you have to do what you love and I am blessed that I get to do what I love as a profession. And, you know, and I think the best thing is, is like all my friends just let me be me. And I didn't, you know, I was trying to be like fit in this like little box and I'm so unique and emotional and, you know, I have so many different things going on at like one time and getting pulled in so many different directions and, and I love it. I think it's made me a better person. It's, it's, uh, you know, exhilarating, I think at times. So, you know, when I, when I take a step back and I'm like, this is like, I'm really enjoying today. Like I made the cut, like I'm really enjoying like getting up to, ready to go bowl. So, and I, I really do live my life <laughs> the same exact way as I bowl. Um, I'm very passionate. I, you know, so I want the best for everyone and what they're going to be happy with. So that's what I kind of like roll with forever. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah, but I mean, anyone could ask me any question and I would honestly give an answer to the best of my ability. Now, I'm not Thing, but I mean, I'm pretty intelligent. So <laughs> I would. <laughs> well, real quick, Lindsay, it's funny because I, I actually had that question written down. Maybe not the same way Luke asked it, but uh, yeah, definitely not the same way. I didn't get, didn't ask it. I'm glad that he asked it. But we actually just watched uh, Stephanie Johnson win on TV, and when she threw her second shot, um, she couldn't even get up and throw her field ball. She was crying so hard she had to sit down. And the fill ball didn't matter. She needed to have one or two pins, I believe. Yeah. And uh, she was having trouble even getting that out. So it just reminded me that day when you get your win uh, on TV, it's probably going to be like that. Stephanie's emotional, and, and, and she should be, and she's won more than once. So when you win your first title, emotion's fine. Absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't want to I, – I want the world to see that, you know, we're not like robots or – you know, like what you see, maybe, you know, like, why don't they look happy? Well, I mean, do you look happy in competition when you're not doing well? Is <laughs> <laughs> that like, like a real question? Of course, like, of course we're not happy. Mm -hmm. you know, but Stephanie is honestly one of the greatest people I've ever met. We've been friends forever and she deserves it. She, um, you know, and especially since we're moms. So, you know, she's perfect. For a significant amount of time as, as I am. And, you know, we just have like this work life balance, but she is an amazing competitor and an even awesome, just an awesome person. All right. One last question. Once, uh, once you uh, think about all of all the people that have helped you and some of your sponsors, um, yeah. just take a moment and talk about some of the, the people that have helped you. Some of, the, some of the viewers who may not have heard you talk a little bit about some of those people earlier. Um, you know, um, I dreamt of being on the forum staff, which was a very long time ago, so I don't show my age. Um, <laughs> I uh, I always uh, wanted to be Buller's company, and Bill and Barbara Christman are amazing people, and they welcome me into their family and honestly, you know, believe in me. Um, I, I'm glad that I have more of a personal relationship with them than most of our staffers because we live there. But uh, it's it's really incredible. I'm I'm blessed for that. Um, and then H5G, the Jersey company, they gave me a job, and I get to do it from home, so it helps with my son. Um, but uh, the real the real thank yous are for all of my smart, uh, sponsors and um, Artemis um, is one of my main sponsors that's not bowling related. Sam Hall made a, um, a nonprofit organization to help women helping women. And so if you'll see like the Artemis logo on my back, like when you watch Bowl TV, um, you know, that's him inspiring other women. And so uh, we met and he was like, I just love everything about you and I, you know, I want to be involved in bowling. So that's kind of how I 
I got that, um, you know, great sponsorship. So, and then especially to my husband, because he's awesome. <laughs> so um, I wouldn't be anywhere without him because he's like my BFF. I mean, I've been away from him for four days and I'm like seriously feeling it. So <laughs> <laughs> I have like 18 days left, but he's an amazing person. And, you know, I, I feel like if you're surrounded by amazing people and you do or you try to do the right thing and you're honest with yourself, then amazing things can happen. And, you know, that's really the place that I am right now. Um, so yes, H5G, Storm, um, and then especially Turbo uh, is my driven to bowl, 100% switch grips. I love it. I don't use tape. Most people don't know that. Um, I hate in my thumb hole. So, <laughs> makes me um, like 17 different thumbs and I just like yeah. switch. So without that, I probably wouldn't survive bowling. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's just, you know, that's me. That's it. All right. Well, you talked about Hank. Uh, I've got to throw a quick shout out to him also because at any moment he could terminate my contract. Uh, <laughs> a couple of times I've been out at the, uh, been out at headquarters on the way to, to nationals and, uh, both times, uh, him, him, and some other guys, uh, Chad, Kendall, all the guys, and Hank had come down and helped me out a little bit uh, with my arsenal. And just to, to be perfectly honest with my game, some of the things Hank told me, um, I still think about today. So uh, I want to make sure I got that in, get some brownie points, Lindsay. I know this was tricky. We had uh, we had to schedule a couple times, some things come up in bowling, uh, and then we had to cancel last week. So. Uh, we appreciate you sticking through all this and uh, and getting this set up to where uh, you're you're good to go there. And uh, good luck in the, in the rest of the PWBA tour. I hope so. Like if I make the Queen show, he's are gonna fly out. So that's my motivation. There you go. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we will let you go. Have a, have a good night. You too. All right. Bye. All right. PWBA bowler. Professional bowler, of course, Lindsay yeah. Boomershine. Uh, we had some tricky time with her getting her on, but she she made it happen this week, and we appreciate that. Not always easy, Luke, when they're traveling. I know the, the travails of, of the tour and how it goes. So let's uh, give you and I a second here before we bring in our next guest, and let's take a moment and play a commercial. Totally worth it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bobby Jackson's Trading is the place to sell all your unwanted precious metals, including broken gold and silver jewelry. They also buy old silver and gold coins, so check them out for all your buying and selling needs. Also, did you know that Bobby Jackson's Trading pays top dollar for your unwanted gift cards? You know the ones your grandma got you for Christmas? Bobby Jackson's Trading is located on 23rd Street, just one block east of Nolan Road in Independence, Missouri. They're open seven days a week. Check them out at bobbyjacksons.com or give Bob Foster a call at 816-463-1919. That's 816-463-1919. All right, welcome back to the show. As uh, Luke limbers up, we'll just say, uh, getting his left in is... Uh... They call them twelve ounce curls when that when it's beer. I don't know what they call it for. Uh, I have no idea. Whatever in the world, uh, water you're drinking there. Yeah, yeah. Water. <laughs> Got any sponsors on that? We should get a we should get a sponsor for whatever you drink. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, definitely Norseman Brewery. Now they they care they care uh, Norseman Brewing. Right? Yeah, they they do beer, and so we do that on our uh, the breakdown pair on Wednesday nights, and then it just depends on what I'm in the mood for. If I'm in the mood for anything on the. Uh, on our shows, I'm, I'm sponsored by a convenience store ice tea. Yeah, that's yeah. my that's my thing. <laughs> that's uh, that's in case anybody was wondering. I don't actually can't see that on screen, right? Yeah, right. I got a little. Uh, right I'm drinking some Cuervo Silver out of a Glenlivet glass. So I don't know what any of those were. All for, kinds but of let's, contradictions. Uh, let's move yeah, on. <laughs> <laughs> the, the bowler show here. We're on to the second hour, and uh, we went a little long there. We've had uh, some really good time with Ron Ron Moore and Lindsey Boomershine. So uh, first of all, I want to thank our guests for being. Uh, appreciated the time as, as you know on the YouTube show here now we don't have any time constraints so we can go as long or short as we want yeah. so uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and bring on our next guest of course you mentioned him earlier he's uh, on the, the team all events team that had to lead for uh, I don't know a few hours and yeah. of course he is leading himself in all events at 2220 his name is Brett Cunningham Brett welcome to the bowler show how are we doing guys 
We're doing great. I actually like our first interaction was uh, I was like, hey, can you come on the show tonight? And you're like, uh, we're probably going to be down uh, downtown celebrating. We'll say so that's uh, did you guys get a good celebration that night? Uh, that night, we actually just hung out at the bar at the South Point. The next night, I believe it was Sunday night. We went down a couple of us went down to Fremont and watched that show. Yeah. So be it. But uh, yeah, it's always a good time down there watching the just people watching, basically. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. no doubt. It, all of Vegas is pretty good for that. But yeah, that's a good, definitely a good spot. Um, we talked about the team event here right off, and you guys obviously had to think when you shot that score that hey, you know, we just broke the all-time record. This is we're going to win this year. Um, how quickly did, did did you guys get the news and, and know all of a sudden? As an incredible score as you shot, somebody just broken it the next day. Uh, it was four days later, so you know we got to we got I to know. enjoy it a little bit. I'm not, my bad, I thought it was the next day. Anyway, it felt, it felt like the next day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. Um, but yeah, we actually had already made it home. Um, one of my teammates texted me. I was driving home from work, and he goes, uh, "So that lasted a long time." And I was like, "What are you talking about?" Uh, he goes, uh, Ronnie Sparks team is about to beat us. And I'm like, seriously? I'm like, <laughs> not that it not that it was ever a guarantee by any means. If you looked at my Facebook post, I think I said we had about an 80% chance, I figured. Mm-hmm. Um, but breaking the record would have been, I don't know, well, we did break the record, but holding the record for more than a couple of days would have been pretty cool. <laughs> getting, getting a banner up on the uh, thing with the record on it would have been cooler. But uh is what it is, and scores are all relative year to year. I mean, mm-hmm. we're pulling out different patterns every year, so um, I guess it really doesn't matter if you break the record if you don't hold it at the end of the year. Yeah, still, that's that's the the holy grail. You know, people see, hey, this guy won singles, this guy won doubles, but for teams like yourself, yeah. the Mento Produce team, you guys know that this is the one that people want to win. And you guys had an amazing performance. Um, talk a little bit about some of your other team members. Of course, we know Anthony Pepe and Derek Magno. Did I say that right? I hope I said yeah, that right. I so. hope I said that right. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Uh, boy, I'm going to really butcher this. Conti, and I can't remember your other bowler. So uh, take us through some of the things you guys did, you know, other than just the obvious things. Hey, we broke down the lanes, whatever. What, what's some of the things that made your team click this year? Um, I think the – biggest change we made this year um we we split me and steve up in doubles um put me on the pair with a couple straighter guys to try to allow us to kind of open them up the way we wanted to steve usually likes to hook it a lot um he didn't this year so i'm not sure it would have mattered but we put him on a pair with a couple guys that we weren't really worried about what he did to the lanes. He could kind of do what he wanted and feel free to freewheel it like he likes to do. Um, me, Joe, and Derek, um, this is really only our third year bowling together. They won the first year we had bowled together, but I was on the, quote, B team that year because I couldn't bowl with Anthony uh, because of PBA restrictions. Um but yeah, the whole uh, the whole doubles and singles pairings was probably our biggest uh, biggest change that went really well. I thought mm-hmm. allowed us straighter guys to stay straighter longer. Okay, well, you shot six sixty in team, and then you come back the next day with a measly fifteen sixty. Uh, talk a little bit about the difference in patterns. Obviously, six sixty is nothing nothing that's that bad out at nationals at any time. But uh, what was the biggest difference for you in the patterns that allowed you to score so much higher? Um, I, I could stay right longer in doubles and singles. Um, if anybody's ever watched me, I am much better if I can stay right of 10, and I never really had to move left of 10. Uh, team felt like there was a lot more friction, so it kind of forced us left quicker than we wanted to. Um, when we got done bowling team, I think we shot like 33-0 something, and – we all looked at each other like it felt like we bowled nothing. Like they felt easy, but it just the pins didn't go our way that day. And then uh, the next day, uh, everything went our way. We, 
I got done bowling. I looked at Derek and I said, uh, I'm not sure I left a ring 10 today. And he goes, what? I go, I think I left one 10, but it was a week 10. I'm not sure I rang a 10 for six <laughs> weeks. Almost impossible. Now, which, which part of the house were you guys in again? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> which side? How about that? We were on the high side, high 40s. Low, I think we were on like 49 to 54 between all of us, something like okay. that. That's been uh, so far. That's been some some good scores on those pairs. Um, you, you talked about the eighty percent chance of your team of all all events holding. I didn't see that post. Did you put a percentage on on yourself on your all events score holding? Yeah, I thought I had about a three percent chance. <laughs> now, do you base um, that you basing that on on just how how you felt like the lanes were? You feel like with all the guys that's still to come, including Luke and myself. Look that out. could uh, break that score, even though I don't break eighteen hundred very often. <laughs> uh, did you just you just feel like they're they're I wouldn't say soft, but softened up enough to where uh, some people are going to break that score? Um, yeah, they're definitely softer than they I've ever seen them. Um, the percentages was basically I felt like I felt like I got cut up pretty bad in team event, so I felt like I left sixty to seventy out there in team. Um, I wasn't sure anybody could shoot more than the 1560, but that's already happened too. So, um, I, my chances, I, I would, I, somebody asked me the other day, I think I said 10 or 15% still, if I can get past tonight, I'll be extremely excited with, uh, the team nabber up there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Adam our, yeah. Adam and Mike and all them. Um, yeah, the 1560 though, I, I, that's about as good as I could possibly bowl. And Jekko, I think he shot about fifteen eighty or something like that. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's insane to be perfectly honest. That's uh, I've got a couple of years literally at, at nationals underneath that. Uh, for nine <laughs> games. For nine so game. <laughs> my, my nine game versus your six game might be a good good bet. I'm hoping for better this year. But um, take take a moment. Obviously, we've talked about your scores and and how the lanes are. What's, what's maybe some without giving away too many trade secrets? What's uh, what's some good tips for some of us who are going to be heading out there later? Uh, just make sure. So we like to go in early April. Um, next year we're going to go a touch later, but we like to go when we're sharp. Um, mm -hmm. In our area, there's like three or four major tournaments um, in late February and throughout March. So and they're all on very demanding conditions. So we're bowling on extremely tough patterns for a month or so before we go um, and bowling all against each other. And it's it's really you just got to be sharp when you get there. You got to be at the top of your game, even even though they're softer. In order to put up those kind of numbers, we're all extremely, extremely sharp and all practicing all the way up until the time we get there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Dave's going to go here in about a month, and I'm I'm actually going at the end of the tournament. Normally, uh, the guy the guy that uh, arranges our teams just finished up. Uh, him and his wife ran the Greater Ozarks in Springfield, and so they'd always have to go later. And so we just kind of we kind of go later in the year. But yeah, that's definitely a very good point for you know tournament season. Go when you're sharp and after you're bowling on on tough stuff. So that makes a that makes a bunch of sense. Um, let me see. So as far as you shot 799 in doubles, that's always fun shooting 799, but, uh, take me, gosh, I just, I just completely spaced on what I was going to ask. That's <laughs> Ron Moore talked about quick moves. Would you, is that somewhere you were heading? Yeah. Maybe talking about. Uh, this year, maybe the, the moves are quicker. You talked about staying left or staying right at ten, and he did. He he mentioned that too on on singles and doubles. Is staying the the longer you could stay right, the better off you were going to be. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, it was crazy. So I want to say it was like the fifth or sixth frame of doubles. I missed right on a shot, and it actually went high and four pinned. And I looked at one of the guys and I go, "We better start striking because." If I can miss right this early in the day in four pin, these scores <laughs> would be astronomical. Um, yeah. So there was times where I actually a couple times where I two pinned throughout the block, and I would actually just chase it left, assuming my ball was just a touch spent in the heads, 
and moves that you wouldn't normally think of when you two pin. Yeah. Uh, the the way we broke them down, I you just got to assume that you're still throwing it crisp and you're still, like I said, you're still that sharp and you just got to trust your moves, trust what you're thinking and trust what you're seeing. Yeah. And that's the other thing too, is, uh, I, uh, the word that a lot of guys that I've talked to have used to describe this year is playable. So normally when you think about team is you're like, okay, we gotta, we gotta plan and practice to break them down. And then you think about burning the, you know, half of the first game almost to get the lanes broken down. But, what kind of condition were they in in practice and how quickly did you think that you could get into like scoring mode, I guess? Um, so after our team practice session downstairs, we actually kind of just went to the theory that they were easy enough to start with. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't really waste any time. Um, we each threw two shots with balls that, weren't even really dull. They were just 4,000, just not shiny, just something that wasn't super dull and used two shots to the right of 10 to kind of just preserve the middle of the lane more than anything. It wasn't to try to break it down anymore because we felt like they were already easy enough to start with. Yeah, I've heard from a lot of people saying stuff like uh, uh, Dark Code, Rubicon. What kind of stuff were you using out there? Um. I used mainly a phase two um, on the fresh on both patterns. Um, and then I got into, uh, what did I even get into? So it's tough. We, uh, this is the other good part about this whole story is right before we went out, all the stuff with storm happened. So oh, um, no. we, uh, I actually sh had shipped balls, a couple balls already that I ended up not being able to use. Mm -hmm. Um, trying to think what I went to in the team. I think I went to a Zen for about a game and a half and then into a high road Pearl. Yeah. Um, and once again, no real surface on them, just kind of clean them up and let them do their thing. Yeah. So that, uh, that's the other thing too, is I, I've heard that there's not a whole lot of surface out there. Cause normally you think for team to, to burn stuff up, you're wanting like 500 grit stuff right up you know, three, four, five, something like that to groove them in. And I heard it's it's quite a bit different uh, this year. So that's that's a good thing to hear. Now, I did see your post about your your predictions for for how things are all going to shake out. So it looks like you think that somebody can still get to 2,300 in all events. Uh, you're leading right now. Uh, so I, I haven't been out there yet, but... Uh, you seem to know what you're, I'm sure that you know what you're talking about. So talk a little bit more about your predictions there. Um, yeah. So for the most part, the team, all, so I'll start with the team all events just because we already got beat, but it's just unfathomable, unfathomable to me for anybody else to shoot that high. It's just such a, it seems such like a ridiculous number of nationals. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's times where you could put a house shot out and not shoot those kind of numbers for, yeah. And, um, so I kind of stuck with that one. Team, I felt like, like I said, I feel like they're relatively easy. You just got to get five guys going together. Um, but from what I've watched when I have been taking peaks, I guess team might be a little harder than we thought. Um, nobody's really bombing them in team. 730 to 750 seems like a great score. Um, so it might not get as high as I thought it would, but it only takes two guys doing that, and then the other three just plugging along to get to the 35, I think I said 3580, something like mm -hmm. that. Um, doubles, I think I said 1560 might be a touch high too, but they they just feel easy. They just felt so easy. Um, like I said, I mean, I missed right frame five or six, and it went high, so – <laughs> They're obviously super playable to start with and just got to get two guys going together basically to get there. Um, singles, it's kind of a crapshoot because if you play them badly to start, I don't think you're ever going to get to a number that you need to. Um, and I'm really not sure that the guys that throw urethane to shoot big numbers and doubles can get there after throwing the urethane. Yeah. Um, 
in the all events number, I'm just saying 23. I think I said 23, 23. Last year it was 2,300, two different houses. I felt like the patterns were harder. Yeah. So I just bumped it up a little bit. But I really think it all just comes down to who gets a number in team event. If you can get a number in team event, I think 2,300 is very doable. And actually, yeah. I would be surprised if uh, Wally shot a couple numbers tonight to go by me already. Yeah. Uh, Jekko is in – is that the guy in second Yeah, right now? He only shot 630 in team. Right. So, yeah, so it's kind of interesting looking at some of those scores. It's like, yeah, the, the majority of the all events, so for the, for the ones that are up close to the top, the majority of their score has come from doubles and singles. But it's kind of funny. We were talking to Candace Aro on on the show right before you guys, uh, the week before, a couple weeks before you broke the score. And uh, Matt said, it's like, well, that's the one that he's like, yeah, scores have been higher this year. But he's like, I just don't see anybody getting to that number because it's just such an impossible number. And then you guys then you guys shot it. And then we were completely stunned about that, about the next score. So uh, I, I think I'd have to agree that that one's <laughs> <laughs> the team all event score is going to hang on, uh, but what is it like? I had a I had a friend that won singles in Knoxville in 2003, and he went in May, and he said it's just agonizing for waiting for the tournament to be over with. Or you kind of now because of your prediction, it would seem like you're not really you're not really optimistic that that score is going to hold on, but what's it still like day to day, just kind of watching the score and maybe hoping a little bit or holding out a little bit of hope. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously I would love to win. That'd be great. Um, I, and if the longer I can hold on, the more exciting and optimistic I'll probably get. Um, but I have been watching scores only when people are like, Hey, this guy's going to shoot this. And I'm like, oh, all right, I'll go take a peek and see what's going on. But um, unless it's a team that I'm familiar with, I'm not really super paying attention. A couple of days ago, a couple of weeks ago, maybe AJ Chapman and Stu were out there, and my buddy's like, hey, AJ's about to beat you. And I'm like, all right, I'll go look. And all right. I looked, and I'm like, oh, he needs 500 the last two. I'm like, it's doable, but yeah, if you know it, it's not as doable. <laughs> <laughs> So. Now, for the casual fan, we want to let people know. Somebody asked in the chat, uh, who in the world is Wally? Of course, we know that's Brian Wallachek, or we assume that's who you're talking about. Correct. So we want to clear that up real quick. Um, I had to step away for a minute. We're trying to get Stephanie Johnson on the show here. It does not appear like she's going to be able to make mm. it, so uh, we won't be bumping Aaron Smith any further back. Party animal. That's a bad break. She's way better looking than both of us. <laughs> now, and Luke likes to talk to the girls better. He, he, that's his yeah, thing. Yeah. BWBA bowlers, he, he doesn't like uh, all those guys with rev rates and stuff who just the guys are curl okay, it down but... the lane. So, Well, I mean, I have like a female rev rate, so that should help you a little bit. <laughs> I, I can relate to that. It's at my advanced age now. So, um, Did Luke get a chance to talk to you about any specific equipment? Can you can you let us know what uh, what all you threw out there? Uh, we talked about it a little bit. I told him I started with a phase two in team, switched to a Zen, and then a high road pearl. Um, we kind of got into not needing surface out there. Um, a lot of our guys actually shine stuff up, which we never do. Um, <laughs> Definitely not a national. Right, exactly. There's, I mean, there's been years where we'd go in there, and no matter what we did, we'd touch it with a three thousand pad or a two thousand mm -hmm. pad, just so that it had something fresh on it. Um, to put, oh, I mean, we literally, I mean, maybe one ball or two balls had three or four thousand on it, and then all the rest of them were either shiny or lane shined or just clean. Uh, how close do you think that you mentioned the team practice session, and that's even when it's in the same building, it's doesn't ever seem to be super representative. How close do you feel? I, did you bowl the BJ too, the Bowler Journal? Yep. I uh, I went out uh, like three or four days early and got one BJ session in each day. Um, the I, I, I feel like the shapes are close. Um, so you can get a decent idea. Um, the regular bowling center 
generally is a little bit older, so it tends to hook a little bit more and a little bit more in the fronts. Yeah. You might need to use a little bit cleaner stuff in that center, but shape-wise, I felt like they were very close. Okay. Yeah, and I, uh, the last time I saw you in person, I think, was at the Bowler Journal. I believe you were working the counter, correct? Uh, yeah, it's probably like four or five years ago, something like that. <laughs> Uh, so, you, so you've watched a lot. You should you should do well out there, right? I mean, in theory, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I believe Chad once said that if he could watch every day, he'd win an eagle every year. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I, so I, I was, maybe I'm just due to get my eagles now that I watched for so long. There you go. <laughs> I was fortunate enough to work there last year for about a month myself. I worked with Matt Canizaro and, and media relations, and of course that voided my last year of bowling so i didn't get a chance to bowl but i it's you know i get it i can understand why they wouldn't want you know somebody who watched bowling basically for a month to come out a couple weeks later and post a score and then all of a sudden then you got a new controversy in bowling that uh, yeah, you know yeah. always seems to pop up here every couple of weeks yeah there's plenty of that already we don't need any more <laughs> no way way too much uh, way too much with that um Take a minute and take us take us back in your career when you first started. Uh, and Linda Woods is right down the road from us here, uh, two time All American. How do, how do you think some of that uh, coaching and uh, some of the things you did in, in college uh, applied to your bowling later on in your career? Uh, well, I know when I'm so I went to Mohawk Valley for two years before I went to Lindenwood, um, but. I feel like bowling as a team is so much different than bowling as individuals. Um, you got to be talking to each other. You got to be communicating, um, especially if you want to shoot monster numbers. Um, if you're not relaying information that you're seeing and you miss a move, not only did you miss a move, but the two people behind you missed the move. So even though you cost yourself 30 by not seeing it yourself, you might be able to save the other two guys 20 or 30 by letting them know what you saw. All right. I, it's funny because the thing that we do like to ask each bowler who ends up at the top of the leaderboard is if they're a scoreboard watcher or not. And I know we, you kind of covered that, uh, you know, Adam Barta is on there 24 seven. He says he's, he's checking the score. <laughs> It sounds like you're not one of those guys. You'll you'll check when somebody says, "Hey, this guy's got this going" or whatever. But um, obviously, we're still in we're still in May, and there's still two months to go. So I, I think I'd be a scoreboard watcher, but more towards the uh, late June, early July portion. Yeah, if I can get to July first, I'll be I'll have the updates programmed on my phone. I'll have all <laughs> yeah. that stuff ready to go. But for now, it's uh, it's golf season, so that takes my mind away from it a lot. Yeah, we don't get much good weather up here, so uh, I got to take advantage of it when it's nice. Yeah. All right, Brad. Well, uh, best of luck to you. Hopefully, some of these scores uh, hold up. Right now, at least or earlier in the day, you were 17th in teams, 16th in singles, fifth in doubles, and of course, first in all events and second in team all events. So uh, that's pretty incredible. We're we're a couple of months in here, and you're in the top 17 all of, all, all of those events. So. Uh, yeah, leaving that's... town with with that uh, that type of resume, that's that's some great bowling, man. Oh, and just so you know, the last bowler on my team is Steve Meyer. Just so I don't get any oh, yeah, okay. grief for not you know giving Steve a shout out <laughs> on here. I, I did not write the names down. I was going off of uh, going off of what I could remember in my head, and, and I don't know Steve personally, so hopefully that's uh, not too big a slight for some of your team members that are watching. But uh, Brett, you got anything else for before we let you go? I got nothing right now. Just thanks for having me on, guys. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for making it work, and uh, good luck on the, the scoreboard watching, and, and we'll catch up with you later. All right. Have a good one. All right. Brett Cunningham, first in all events, 22-20 is the score. 3% chance he gives it, Luke, of uh, holding up. That's kind of funny. I, I Obviously, that seems like a score this year that might go quickly, but hey, you never know. As The more they lay the pattern down, what may or may not happen. So. Yeah, and it, it's – and again, like you were talking about with some certain pairs, maybe some of the the big guns coming later catch a catch a pair that that isn't great, or there's just so many variables that you go out there and you shoot what you can shoot, and then you go back next year and you do it again, and eventually, you know, you shoot your shot of enough times and hope something like this will happen and hold up. So either way, I mean, 
twenty-two twenty or whatever he shot was is is a monster number. So no doubt, we'll uh, we'll keep track of that and see how see how it it, it holds up. It, it, we've seen it many times uh, in April. The scores will hold up the whole time. Yeah, and then uh, like we saw with Team All Events, four days later, I thought it was the next day for whatever reason. Yeah. It was a I have to check with our crack staff on our on the, the stats they gave me. Of course, I do my own research. So, <laughs> yeah. but anyway, uh, boy, this uh, is a bittersweet part of the show right now. This is uh, this this one could be tough for me. It's been a lot yeah. of a lot of years, and uh, obviously, we just came back three months ago. But uh, an icon of the USBC Open Championships is no longer uh, with the USBC, and of course, he's no longer with us. Uh, the man who is taking over him has, uh, has filled in before on the show, and he's always done a great job. So let's bring him in right now. I don't know if I have an official uh, title for him right now. I know he is with the USBC Communications. We'll just leave it at that for now. Uh, Aaron, how are you doing tonight, sir? Hey, Waz. Uh, yeah, Communications, that sounds good. Uh, absolutely. I appreciate you guys having me on. Uh, definitely a little bittersweet being here today, of course, with uh, – with some of the things that have transpired over the past uh, past couple of weeks here. Um, but at the moment, the show's going on. Team NABR is in the squad room. Uh, they're wearing phenomenal shirts right now. Uh, <laughs> Mike Rose Jr. picked them out. Edin Barta hates it. Um, but they're going <laughs> for Team All Events, you know, in a couple of minutes here after a great performance yesterday. So uh, we got to continue on the USBC Open Championships trend. I know that's what Matt would want as well. So uh, we're here and we're ready. I did, I did see uh, Team Super Mario was was out there. The uh, uh, some something earlier, I saw a picture and they had the whole they had the whole get up. They even had hats on for for the different Mario and Luigi and and uh, uh, Yoshi. So <laughs> yeah, that was a uh, red carpet lane. So uh, awesome portion of that. Chris Pearson and David Lubinsky came back the other day. Uh, they were the 2021 regular doubles champions. And so, you know, one of the big things about coming back as a champion, you get the opportunity to uh, not only have the spotlight, uh, you get your ceremonial march out, but you also get to pick, you know, your song. So they mm. actually picked the Super Mario song as they were marching out in their Super Mario gear. So the whole team was dressed up. Uh, Chad Moss and Dave Barris even had mustaches. Uh, great stuff. Great stuff. Uh, Chris and Dave came up a little bit short, but 538, the last game to uh, get to a very respectable 1398 in their quest for a title defense. Uh, didn't quite get all the way there, but uh, top 20 score. Uh, can't ask for much more, uh, you know, coming back, uh, you know, trying to uh, trying to repeat. All right, Aaron, a couple of things I want to clean up before we get too much further in the show. Um, talk, uh, let's. <laughs> It's hard for me too. I know it's hard for you. You've got, you've got, you know, you've got to take over the duties now. But a couple things Matt has always done for me. This is my 25th year, and he promised me uh, I could pick out my march out song. So <laughs> you want to mark that down in your calendar, June yeah. 16th. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, actually, I'm joking about that one. But uh, I, I've always, I'm not a token guy, so I've always used Matt's uh, office for my bowling equipment. So I, I expect that you will be uh, gracious when I get out there with my 14 bowling balls to unload them in that office there. You, you know how tiny this office is. 14 <laughs> bowling balls are going to cost you. So just be prepared. All right. The hot dog cart is not too far away. Um, so you're just going to have to open up a tab there. That's what you're going to have to do. I had, if you had over under a four minutes on the hot dog cart in the show, in this segment, <laughs> yeah. I think we just made it under, but uh, uh, there have been a few hot dogs in that same office. Let's just put it that way. And then uh, in the uh, little cubicle that Matt procured for me. So I, I, I want to have some fun with this too, because it, it's, it's tough, but uh, you know, we can't, we don't want to just dismiss the fact that uh, everything that Matt did and like you put on your Facebook post, you could put a million different things on there, but basically, um, you know, you just said thanks because he got you into this. Um, take take a quick moment and tell us tell us how that all started with with you joining up with Matt. Absolutely, uh, back in two thousand nine, um, I was fresh out of college, uh, hated my job, uh, so I was looking to do something cool in bowling, and um, you know, I was really hoping, uh, you know, through searching multiple. Uh, avenues uh, across the board, found a few job openings with USBC, applied, uh, didn't actually get the job that uh, I had applied for, uh, but I made enough of an impression to get asked to go to the Women's Championships uh, in 2009 in Reno uh, to work as a traveler. Um, so from there, uh, once I got the assignment, once I headed out, 
uh, all of a sudden, you know, even though he was in Las Vegas at the time at the Cashman Center in 2009, uh, Matt was, you know, essentially my boss from day number one. Uh, so from there, we learned uh, we learned a lot along the way, a lot of great stories. But every day outside of the past couple of weeks in my USBC tenure uh, has been with Matt literally sitting right next to him, you know, whether it's across the desk here, like we have at South Point or even back at the campus uh, in Arlington, uh, you know, we've sat across from each other, uh, had to awkwardly stare at each other from time to time as well, uh, just without any dividers in between at the time. But, uh, but Matt has, you know, shown me the ropes in this industry. Uh, so at, as I said in the post you reference, you know, there's uh, a million things I could say about Matt and the things he's taught me and the people he's introduced me to and just the, you know, the stories, the good times we've shared. But, uh, you know, I'm I, I'm not here right now if it isn't for Matt. Uh, you know, even going back uh, after that first event in 2009, work 2010, I didn't work the tournaments in 2011. Uh, I ended up coming back in 12 and it was, you know, part of Matt's pushing with, uh, with the folks at USBC to bring me along full time in 2013. So uh, without that, who knows where... I could be. Uh, so I'm, I'm very thankful for everything Matt has not only done for the sport of bowling, uh, but uh, but for me personally as well. Uh, and, you know, in, in the talks we've had, uh, obviously, uh, a lot of tough talks over the past couple uh, couple weeks, couple months uh, leading up to where we're at now. But, uh, you know, the the one big takeaway from and I, I'll, I'll be honest with you guys, everybody I've talked to, interviewed, since I've been here, they've all asked me about Matt. <laughs> First, Matt, how, how is he doing? Uh, you know, checking up on him, just wondering what's up because he's the face of this tournament. He's been the face of this tournament since 2005. Um, so, uh, you know, for me right now, it's, uh, you know, just trying to carry on the legacy. Uh, but everything I've learned, as Matt would say, I learned from him. Uh, so uh, hopefully we're, we're in good shape. Uh, you know, looking at the Jeff Nimke, uh, story from last night and everything that came together from that. I remembered all the, the big details. Uh, so I'm, I think Matt would be happy about that. So those are the things uh, I'm trying to continue on with this. Uh, but, uh, you know, obviously wishing Matt the best in his journey moving forward. Uh, we're still going to, I texted him a couple of times already today as, as well, just uh, trying to work through a couple of uh, things I haven't worked on yet. Uh, so he, he's still gracious with his time with me and I appreciate that. And uh, I, I know he's watching the OC from afar. Yeah, and you said he's the face of the USBC Open Championships. And for those who don't know his face, he's definitely the voice of the USBC Open Championships. Mm -hmm. As Matt has told us many times on the show, he's walked by a lot of people, and then all of a sudden he speaks, and they're like, oh, I know that guy. Yeah. Uh, he, they know him from his distinctive voice. And and I'll, I'll do one more. Uh, I'll wax poetic one more time here before we get into the rest of the, the scores this year. Um, there's zero chance I would have been there last year working at the Open Championships if it wasn't for Matt being there. Had that job just open and Matt wasn't involved in it, I never would have done that. So it was one of the reasons I wanted to do it, um, you know, just as far, besides, you know, kind of fulfilling for me to do and something I kind of wanted to, to check off a small bucket list. If Matt wasn't involved, I, I never would have came out there. So that, that just shows you just from what you and I just talked about. Uh, how much Matt means, means to this tournament. So, but um, enough about Matt. Let's move on. I'm sure he's not watching right now. He's somewhere eating a, a hot dog or, <laughs> yeah. or, uh, or 12 hot dogs. I, I don't know. Uh, Aaron, have you ever gotten into the competitive eating with him? It seemed like he talked um, a little bit about that. There was one time at a Texas Rangers game uh, where there was an all you can eat section. And Matt and I, you know, it was Saturday, we were bored, had nothing to do. It was a rainy day, unfortunately, and at the time it wasn't at the new stadium. It was at the the uh, previous one. For some reason in Texas, we have an open air stadium, which didn't make any sense for summer. Uh, but uh, the, the game basically got rained out for you know about an hour and a half, two hours. So we're up in the all you can eat section, and you know waiting for the game to start, bored and just start you know taking down hot dogs. That's uh, that's what you do in the all you can eat section, right? So we get to uh, you know. Uh, there was a time limit. It wasn't based on the time of the game. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're kind of uh, eyeing each other on this and like keeping count. It's like, I, I got up to seven, eight, I got, I think I got up to nine and they were getting ready to take everything out. Uh, so Matt, uh, you know, ran up there, got two more hot dogs, ate number nine, 
and I took like three bites of the next one to make sure he got more than half in case I wanted to steal it <laughs> for some reason uh, to make sure he won that day because I, I feel his his pride would have been hurt if I would have eaten more hot dogs than him that day. Uh, and we finished all that before they actually threw the first pitch of the game. Uh, I think we watched about half of the first inning before we finally said we've had enough. Uh, <laughs> and also, you know, those uh, those uh, those Texas Ranger balls or hot dogs, uh, not, not the best out there. So uh, you got to do what you got to do sometimes. But uh, but definitely a good time. But Matt, uh, I, I've seen him put down some stuff even when he's not hungry. Uh, we went to a few regionals or he went to the regionals. I, uh, I just hung around and, uh, you know, had nothing better to do on some weekends. Uh, so that was always the thing, depending on where the regional was at. Uh, he would try and line up. Uh, if he bowled well, obviously he has to bowl the next day. So that's good. He's getting a check, all that good stuff. Uh, but if he wasn't, then, okay, drown our sorrows with the closest food challenge. Uh, so we did that a couple of times as well. So, uh, But uh, Matt is undefeated. I've never beat him in that. So that's, uh, that's what we got. <laughs> Oh, it's funny because I, I spent a month there last year, and you know, I was even though I was on the other side, um, I, I I would come over there beforehand, and of course afterwards, and I, I never saw Matt eat once. So I know he's you know he's there. He was working twenty hour days. Doesn't have the time to eat, and yeah, he doesn't have the time to eat. But I know you occasionally um, might get away from the tournament here and there, and you kind of know uh, some of the places to go for food and uh, maybe a craft beer. Uh, take a moment, where, you know, for the people who are coming out there this year, uh, where's where's a place or two that you might recommend them to go? Gotcha. Well, um, you know, I've, I've been around this part of Vegas now for uh, 2017, lived out here, uh, and now in 2022. Uh, obviously, South Point has a lot of great options uh, to choose from. I believe 11 is the total number of restaurants. So a little bit of variety, a little bit of everything, you know, if you, if you don't want to just end up at the hot dog cart. Uh, by the way, what's the over under on references of hot dogs? If, if you guys have it. Uh, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11. Yeah. Yeah. You're not yeah. there yet. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you know, if, if you got a rental car, if you want to take an Uber or Lyft and uh, kind of want to head off to someplace different, get away from South point uh, for, for just, uh, you know, something different. Uh, one of the spots not too far away, uh, it's called Slater's 5050. Um, not only a great, uh, as you said, beer selection, uh, pretty pretty solid tap list there, uh, but great burgers, great, uh, everything's burgers and bacon related. So you really can't go wrong with that. Um, so so that's definitely one where, you know, especially if you got the, uh, got the, got the team together, uh, check that out for sure. Uh, pretty casual place, always have a couple TVs going as well. So depending on, you know, we're, we're in playoff season right now, so you can check out the game too while you're there, uh, or you know, as baseball season you know is underway as well. So uh, that's definitely one of the spots uh, that I like. Um, you know, thinking uh, a little bit farther down, um, you know, the M Resort, uh, even farther south than South Point, uh, but a nice place, very nice place actually. Uh, but a lot of restaurants there as well. Enjoy checking that place out. Uh, just a lot of cool spots just to chill relax over there uh and, and then you know even if you're looking for something more casual more quick uh you know there's quite a few pt's pubs around uh so you know more bar food stuff like that but uh you know you can sit, sit up there sit at the bar play some video poker have a good time with, you, with your team uh and, you know plenty of once again plenty of tvs just a nice place to go relax at after uh you know potentially a Great or not so great day on the lanes. So uh, those are a few spots, uh, you know, when I uh, am able to sneak away that I may, uh, you may find me at, but uh, hopefully the bowlers check them out. Hopefully they like them. So hopefully no one comes back with poor reviews for me uh, later on. So. <laughs> well, I know Jeff Riggles doesn't have a poor review for M Resorts. I know he ends up staying there uh, usually a couple of days after the tournament's over and uh, spends a lot of time there. Uh, eating and uh, maybe throwing the, the bones for those of you who like to gamble out there. And uh, that's one of his favorite places too. So that's uh, kind of cool that you mentioned that. Um, Aaron, uh, take take a minute. We had just had Brett Cunningham on and, and he talked about how, how short their 10-4-44 uh, held up in, in team all events. Uh, just at the little time that you've seen here so far, what, what do you think of some of the other scores? Is there any score that sticks out to you that Hey, this score is definitely going to get beat, or is there anything uh, that sticks out that you're like, boy, that that probably will hold up? 
Well, it, it's I think it's been an interesting trend throughout the course of the tournament so far. Uh, and, you know, you see those spikes of, you know, 300 games and, and big scores and things like that. You know, obviously in Brett's situation, you know, the team all events record only lasting for five days before, uh, you know, uh, Ronnie Sparks and Delora Brothers won, ended up taking over the top spot with uh, 10,585. Since I got that wrong on the on the Facebook Live, I might as well get it right here. Um, <laughs> you're mad. You're mad. You didn't have the pin buying year. I told you. I, that's yeah, I, messed that's that the... I, I, I messed that one up, so that was all on me. But, um, but yeah, it, it's, you know, looking at the, uh, you know, 15, 18 in doubles from Pawanda and Odom, you know, that's that's a massive score. And there's so many good teams out here that, that come out here and get off to strong starts. And, you know, you still need to be, uh, you know, almost pushing a thousand for two to, you know, really give yourself a realistic chance to get there. Uh, you know, we see a lot of scores in the, you know, 920s, 930s, 940s. That means you need to be nearly perfect the last game. Uh, so 1500 definitely seems like, uh, you know, a big number out there for sure. Uh, I, I know a lot of the talk has been about singles. I think there's a lot of surprise out there. It hasn't been an 800 yet. Um, and you know what? Maybe it, you know, maybe there's a little light in the bottle for Jeff Nimke with uh, what he did last night here. Uh, you know, being able to get to the lead 796 now, the new number, uh, 300 in that. Uh, it was uh, pretty exciting uh, kind of watching that come down the stretch. Uh, you know, Jeff, uh, Jeff caught a hit or two down the you know, in those final few frames as well to get there, but you need to, you need those hits, uh, you know, yeah. to, you know, beat 50,000 bowlers essentially and, to, and to post the top score in the division. Um, so, you know, I, I think if you listen to, uh, you know, the rumblings on social media, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of folks expect a bigger number in singles, but, uh, you know, no 800s in singles, just one 800 overall for the tournament. So, uh, you know, it's one of those things you've, you know, even talking to uh, Lubinsky and Pearson yesterday, uh, you know, fourteen sixty six for doubles last year seemed like that might not that might not be enough. It ended up being the number though, uh, so you never know. But what you got to do is get your photo taken by you know the media department, which is always step number one, and then you're leaving with the lead. You, anything can happen after that. Yeah. Um. So. I feel like I've already like I already know you, but I used to watch uh, you know the, the the live streams that you'd have from nationals. Obviously, know that you you know know why you can't do those anymore, and of course, uh, not like you really have the time to do them anymore. Uh, watch a bunch of Bull TV, PWBA stuff, see on there all the time. So now that you're now that you're kind of taken over for Matt, how much of uh, how, how exactly are your duties or where you're going to be able to? Uh, spread yourself to how, how, how thin are you going to have to spread yourself here? What, what exactly, what exactly has changed for Aaron Smith? Uh, well, uh, my, my summer change did uh, plan or my summer plans did change quite a bit there. Uh, but originally it looked like, you know, uh, obviously some support with the PWBA tour, uh, you know, bowl TV heading to uh, all the PBA 50 stops as well. I think I had a couple of those on the schedule, uh, but looking ahead, um, you know, Jason Thomas, is running the team for Bowl TV. We got a lot of folks helping out across the spectrum. Uh, so you know the coverage, the amount of coverage, the amount of lanes. Uh, that's not going to change, folks. So uh, you're in good hands. You know, Neil Williams Jr., uh, Mike yeah. Flanagan, Craig Elliott, and others helping out throughout the course, uh, along with JT at uh, every PWBA stop. Uh, so I'm watching from afar. I, I'm going to be interacting in the chat with everybody else. You know, just giving Emil a hard time when I can, giving Flanagan a hard time when I can, uh, and just, uh, you know, enjoying the coverage uh, from there while I'm trying to, uh, you know, potentially figure out all the stuff going on here. Uh, but along with the Open Championships, I'm going to be here till the end of the tournament and, uh, you know, also overlooking things uh, from the staff we have on site in Addison, Illinois for the Women's Championships. Uh, yeah. So that event uh, got underway um, April 24th. We'll go until early July. So they're going to have a break coming up, though, in a couple of days with the Queens coming up. Um, but uh, usually right before that, we see all the scores in the top division kind of start to fall uh, with all the PWBA players uh, making the short drive from Rockford now to uh, to Addison, the Chicagoland area. Uh, so I, I know there are a bunch of teams set up. Uh, you know, uh, Liz Culkin and her crew are the defending team champions there, uh, are ready to bowl in a couple of days. Uh, so I'm excited to see the scores that uh, come out of Addison, Stardust Bowl. Uh, they're, they've been a great host as well. Uh, it's always interesting to see, you know, how to fit a national tournament 
Uh, obviously, you know, everyone's familiar with uh, South Point and the National Bowling Stadium and seen the builds in the past, but uh, just really seeing the way the team put together the venue there. Uh, if you've ever been to Stardust, you know, obviously 84 lanes, it's the biggest in Illinois, but at the same time, uh, very small uh, concourse area, pretty tight area to get back and forth. But, uh, you know, the staff, everybody uh, did a really great job to make sure, you know, the flow of, of everything was uh, great to go for uh, the bowlers to, you know, get in, ch uh, check in their teams, pick up their brackets, get to the lanes, get their photos taken, kind of all that is in great shape. So, uh, you know, that's uh, those are kind of the things I'm uh, taking on, but uh, certainly uh, offering assistance when it comes uh, to those other events as much as I can when uh, when the guys call for help. Yeah, we talked to uh, we talked to Lindsay Boomershine a little while ago, and she's getting ready to bowl again too. And uh, she's got a handful of handful of eagles at the the women's nationals. And uh, we'll go on ahead and uh, getting close to letting you go here, so you can get back to get back to the crazy, but. Adam, Adam Barta can wait. He's, he's yeah, yeah. I just check live scoring. They're not doing anything yet. So, um, Aaron, if you have a couple of more minutes, uh, let's let's talk a little more Matt before we go, and then uh, we'll wipe him completely off the map map next week, or actually in two weeks. Programming programming note: while you're here, um, Luke will be uh, not. Uh, he'll be doing some bowling next week, and so we will not be on the air. So you're gonna have another week off uh, before we really get into a few weeks. Uh, in a row, and then of course, when I make my uh, grand entrance on June sixteenth, you can uh, get things ready for that. But uh, first of all, uh, did you ever come up with a segment name? I, I really couldn't come up with anything great. Uh, this is your show, Waz, not mine. You got to come up with it, man. Well, I could come up with something. You may, you may or may not like it. So right, there's, uh, a, there's a agent, yeah. Agent Smith. We can go with the, the Matrix thing. Or... Wow. Okay. All right. <laughs> Smith segment, uh, air airtime, airtime with Aaron. Uh, Mark well, London yeah. chimed in with uh, Back to black kind of a specific sunglasses. one, but yeah. Uh, Aaron's <laughs> ale rail. I'm not sure how you feel about that one, but uh, we'll take all suggestions. Anybody in the chat who wants to suggest anything, let us know. But uh, three, I got three takeaways from last year. I'll go through real quick here, Aaron, uh, sure. from my time with Matt. And the first one is, and you talk a little bit about this, is, is getting those scores. Obviously, you never want to miss anybody. And, and uh, I, my take, when I saw Matt, of course, the year I worked there last year was a totally different year than any year ever in history. So me being on the other side, every once in a great while when I come over there early, Matt would, might ask for a little help, or I'd go out there when he was out there, and he'd have his book, and you've, you've seen this book before, and, and his little, he's already got the pre-made sheets, and I'm looking up there, I'm like, oh, this team's a regular team, and they're at 1820 after two. What what is he doing? And he's marking down if they all strike out from the second frame. <laughs> and I'm like, Matt, they're they're not gonna do that. I, that I'm, you know, I, as long as they're mathematically eligible, that was something Matt always uh, told me. I'm crossing those teams off of my list. Okay, that team is classified, no, no chance. But uh, Matt, that's something I always struck me. Matt never took any chances on that. And they still had a mathematical chance. He was keeping them alive. So uh, that's one fun story. And, and, of course, when I went out there, uh, you know, I, I didn't know really what the job entailed. It was kind of a, a hasty decision last minute. And, uh, you know, Matt introduced me some, to some writing things. Uh, one of them was the agate. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, I still, to this day, I had a little more, but um, the, the thing that stood out was Matt would, was trying to turn me into a writer in a month. And I told him, I said, hey, you need, to, you need to work on some other things here. You can't turn me into Mike Lupica. But he, he worked with me, and I still I still remember a lot of things he taught me. Uh, some of the, the date abbreviations, I still remember um, the, some of the weird ones like Nebraska versus Wisconsin. Why is one three? Why is one four? I think I could name the five. Well, I'm really putting myself on the spot here. The five states that don't use an abbreviation. I know it's Idaho, Ohio, Maine, Iowa. And Utah, is that correct? Or do you know the agate as well? If, uh, you know, style. As, as they come up, I know, but you, you missed some little state called Texas in there. So just as a heads up. <laughs> yeah, and we fought on Las Vegas, New Mexico. He's like, well, when you use Las Vegas, you don't have to put the state. I'm like, well, what about Las Vegas, New Mexico? <laughs> uh, and then one last quick story. Um, <laughs> this will be funny for me, but um, 
you know, as you know, with the rotation out there with us being on both sides, Matt had to fill in uh, for when Sam and I would have a day off, and uh, which was rare because Matt worked us like a dog. But anyway, he uh, he came over one morning and he, he worked a, worked the shift, and and I came in the afternoon, and he 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 started looking at the floor, and I thought, well, what, what's he doing? He said, well, what are you guys doing over here? He says, are you cleaning up after yourself, or, or you know, there's crumbs everywhere. And those people, people who know Sam and I, we're not the smallest of guys. I said, Matt, you hired 700 pounds of workers and you didn't expect any crumbs. <laughs> so I just wanted to share some of those stories. Um, as you know, as you talked about, Matt was never like a boss. He was, he was your boss. He was my boss. And I don't know exactly you know, how, how many times you got to interact that way, but he was never, never seemed like a boss. But of course, I always treated him that way. And that's just that's the respect that he deserved. Absolutely. Yeah. The, uh, the relationship was, uh, uh, very, you know, mentor student, uh, you know, over the years. So, uh, and, you know, usually like you, you know, talk about, you know, kind of, kind of learn some of those things over and over, you know, when, when Matt would, uh, you know, proof a press release, uh, you know, after a while he, you know, would point out, Hey, you realize you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. And then all of a sudden it'd be like, really, I am. And then all of a sudden, you know, that mental note, okay make sure you do that right this time so Matt doesn't red pen it uh but uh but yeah it was um you, you know for for us just between you know I I think folks who interact with us you know definitely see a little uh you know we have different uh you know we're not exactly built the same way as far as just kind of overall demeanor how we uh interact with folks you know Matt's uh uh you know the guy who's going to come up shake your hand I'm probably going to be the guy who's you know hanging around more in the back not saying as much a little more quiet and probably a little more laid back than Matt, uh, you might say. But uh, at the same time, we're all about the same thing at the end of the day is, uh, you know, providing a, a great experience for the bowlers who come out not only to the Open Championships, but uh, wherever we may be, uh, you know, given the USBC members, uh, you know, hopefully a, a great term experience and uh, hopefully, you know, we, we can share some great things about them along the way as well. Uh, but it's, uh, but, you know, kind of talking about the differences, you mentioned the the score sheet uh, that Matt would take out to the lanes. And in 2016, I, I actually had the first opportunity to work with South Point uh, at the women's championships that year. Uh, so that was the first USBC championship event to be held uh, at the bowling plaza. So I kind of developed my own system there. And then when we came here in 17, you know, uh, we, we had some systems previously that really did a lot for us. And this was kind of, you know, branching out on our own, trying to find a new way. And, you know, all of a sudden Matt is, uh, you know, checking one off one by the other. And I'm like, why are you doing that? And exactly what you said, he didn't want to miss a thing. Uh, ironically enough, though, when I'm out there, I, I have one. Actually, let's see. I think I got it on me right now uh, <laughs> because I'm working right now. So one tiny little piece of paper with all the scores and kind of like the averages. So uh, this is it's seen better days at this point. But, you know, you see 10, 5, 8, 5, 8, a bunch of scratch on it. Uh, but basically, I just run off that and uh, I kind of do the eyeball test. Uh, so not the most exact science, but I feel confident with it. And I think after a while, you know, we mentioned Agent Smith, you know, it's like the matrix. You see all the ones and zeros start to make sense. Uh, I know the scoreboards up there do, even though they don't have the numbers up there, you kind of uh, all of a sudden start to see the scores. Obviously, having the live scoring as kind of the backup it is a fantastic, fantastic way to uh, double check your work uh, like I didn't do when uh, when uh, the team all events uh, record hey. for the second time. But uh, but, you know, we, we each have our own way. And, and at the end of the day, we we, we get to the same uh, the, the same solution at the end. Uh, so that's what it was all about, making sure, uh, you know, we were we were noticing when things were happening, making sure we were there to highlight those moments for the bowlers and, uh, you know, to share the news with the world. Yeah, I, I, you haven't lived until you tried to look at the monitors I had to look at last year compared, <laughs> compared to the giant screen in the plaza uh, that uh, you guys on the, on the soft side got to work with. Because, uh, Aaron, when I first got there last year, I didn't have much time to train. It was like a day. And then Matt's like, good luck, good luck to you. I'm like, oh, okay. So I kind of learned on the fly also, and this is something that will never really apply again, but the live scoring obviously – is where you're doing most of your work. And I didn't realize that until a couple of days in. Because when I first walked in that first day and I looked at those monitors, I, I can't see very well small numbers anyway, uh, far away. 
And I thought, how in the world am I, this is going to be an impossible feat for me to figure out, even just to see the, the classified and the S and the R <laughs> and seeing all these teams. So I figured out real early, and actually with the help of Sam Neves, I'll, I'll throw out the shout out, that 95% of the time you're going to be watching the live scoring uh, on your computer or on your phone, wherever you're at. And that's where you're going to pick up those scores. So it, it was totally different last year. And, uh, you know, I, I, I learned quickly at that in the same way. I would go out, I'd have all the, the stuff written down on pa- pieces of paper and the, the different divisions. This team's got this. And Sam was just the opposite. He would go out with nothing. He would look at the live scoring and he'd just kind of go off of that. And he never made any mistakes either. So, or at least that I know of. I, I only missed one last year, one that got away in uh, standard or classified that snuck through on all events. And as you know, um, the way we had to do it last year, and I keep talking about myself here, but the way the way we had to do it, the, you know, the toughest year ever <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. was, uh, you know, once they exported those scores, you know, you had to do a lot of work real quick to see who who was, you know, okay, classified, standard, who has a shot at, at all events because you really didn't know. The regular division, sure, you know exactly what's going on with those scores because you know the height of the, their averages, you know what they had to shoot, so... But it was a lot of fun, and again, I would have never been there without Matt. So, um, Aaron, if you got anything else, any other Matt stories or anything uh, that's going on this week that we didn't cover, go ahead and uh, take a moment. If not, we will let you get back to your regular scheduled work. Uh, no, I don't have too much to add. Uh, obviously, um, you know, we're always busy with the uh, participation milestones. So we had two more uh, gentlemen reach 50 years uh, just uh just last uh, yesterday and last night, so uh, you know, getting getting uh, getting some uh, some time to spend with them, learn a little bit more about their journeys at the Open Championship. So uh, you know, those stories will be upcoming in the next couple of days. Uh, we're, we're actually a little lighter on the schedule for the next uh, you know three or four days, as far as kind of kind of things planned on the radar. Um, but you know, taking a look at the big board right here, the uh, you know team runner runners up from last year. Uh, are going to be back here in just a couple of days on the 20th. So five days from now, uh, you know, we're going to have some uh, some more big names joining us here. And, and you really never know who's just going to, you know, swing on by. I, I know the last time Matt was on here, he, you, know, you guys asked him, you know, who's coming up. And uh, I, I also like the uh, tactic of really not looking until, you know, I see it on the, uh, you know, stars of the day or, you know, see the person in the venue and be like, oh, all right. Gonna have to do some work here because uh, some great bowlers are on their way. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's just uh, kind of taking it day from day or day to day. Uh, and we're excited to see the bowlers come in and see what uh, what they have in store here for uh, for the scoring pace over at South Point. All right. Well, before we let you go, I, I obviously earlier I was kidding about the march out and the, and the red carpet and stuff for my 25th year. Uh, but I will be disappointed when I when I come to bring my bowling balls in your office if uh, my name is not on the whiteboard. <laughs> well, we're not to June yet, so I guess I have time to add it. But I, I don't know. We'll see what else is going on. Well, we'll, we'll see if we can. Maybe I, I did make it one year. I was on the, I was on there one year. Matt had me on there. I'm not exactly sure why. It must have been a slow slow week. But uh, I made the dignitary board, and I actually. I took a picture of that I still got it on my phone. <laughs> well, we, we can make dreams happen like that. So uh, you just never know. It, it might All be right, there in the middle of June. <laughs> we will let you get back to your to your work. And, uh, and thanks for talking about Matt because he, he deserved he deserved that time, and you know that. And I know that you know in my speakings with Matt over the, all the time we had last year. As I would come from the other side at twelve thirty, we had a couple hours to clean up the agate, clean up stories, whatever. Um, I know that he, uh, the decision is a little easier when he knows that you're there um, to take the mantle and go from go from what he did and uh, continue that. So I know that's uh, that's something a lot of bowlers are going to notice here real soon. You're on top of everything, and uh, we appreciate all the work you're doing out there, sir. Well, thank you guys. I, I appreciate. It. Looking forward to uh, you know keeping keeping everybody updated about the Open Championships, uh, not only through your platform but uh, on ours as well. But uh, Luke, Dave, appreciate the time, guys. Thank you so much. Right. Have a good night. Tell Adam Barter we said hi. Will do. All right. Once again, uh, USBC Communications, Aaron Smith joining us here. He's our anchorman of the show. And uh, I just know, gave him Matt's title. 
I, just, I, I wasn't sure how was, to handle, yeah. handle that. I, did you put that in the promo? Did I yeah, yeah, I put that in the promo because I, I, I always try to, you know, find something to not just say, oh, so Aaron Smith. So yeah, I just I, I already had it I already had it typed in there, and so I just replaced Matt Canizzaro with Aaron Smith. So yeah. he's the new communications director. Yes, he is, and that's uh, he, like I said, he's going to do a great job. Obviously, he has the same passion uh, and that Matt has, and we all do things differently out there, and we, we look forward to seeing everything Aaron um, has an off has to offer in the next couple of months. And of course, I'll be there in a month. You'll be there in a couple of months, and then we'll get to talk to him in person. So, Luke, you got anything else for the show today? Are we ready to wrap this thing up? Uh, yeah, just the uh, PBA playoffs today. If you weren't with us earlier, Kyle Troop won that. Spoiler alert, sorry. Uh, and then the uh, PWBA Rockford Open, Stephanie Johnson ran the ladder to end up taking it. So, some exciting stuff. And then we've got, so, the PBA season, I think, is over kind of over they have a few uh promo things coming up uh, one really cool thing is that they're doing is uh a P- a pba family thing so chris barnes is gonna bowl with ryan and then uh west malott's gonna bowl with his son and parker bones gonna bowl with one of his uh, one of them <laughs> uh and then uh kyle's gonna bowl with guppy so that's gonna be fun then they've got the uh uh king of the lanes that they do. And of course the, the PWBA season just got started with the Rockford open. So they've got all kinds of stuff coming up here for the next couple months. So. All right, let's, uh, let's, let's end this baby. Uh, I want to thank all of our sponsors. Also want to thank uh, your wife, Angel for producing the show and uh, getting all the links out to everybody. Zero problems today with technology. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, that <laughs> every, is always helpful for us. Every time somebody pops on and we can hear him, I kind of go, yes. <laughs> Uh, believe me, I, I you know started the show on radio and it was it was a nightmare sometimes yeah. getting people on. So I know it's it's a challenge and uh, Angel does a great job, and I'm glad she's doing it for us. That way you that's something you don't have to do mm-hmm. uh, because you know I can't do that kind of stuff. So let's uh, let's let's wrap this thing up. Uh, we want to thank everybody for watching uh, on YouTube. We didn't really get too many chances to look at the chat today. We did answer a couple yeah. of questions. Hopefully. That's some- we got a little. Is there was there anything in there that we missed that we should, yeah, should bring up? There was a few things people wanted to talk to Lindsay, yeah. and then uh, John had a question for Aaron. But we had uh, we had some pretty good guests today that okay. had plenty to plenty to talk about. So, all right. Well, that's going to do it for this week's edition of the Bowler Show. We want to thank all of our sponsors: Storm Bowling, SNH Custom Homes, Coolwick, I Am Bowling, SR GBBFS, hashtag Storm Rover Bowling Balls for Sale. Yeah. Double J's Pro Shop, Bowler's Mart, and, of course, BobbyJacksons.com. Yeah. So that is going to do it for this week's show. Once again, uh, programming note, we will not be here next week. Uh, sometimes bowling takes precedence, and uh, we're not going to be able to do the show next week. So we will see you on May 29th. <laughs>